This week's episode is sponsored by HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supply company in Scotland, where you can buy your whole kitchen online with all the prices on show, no gimmicks, just straightforward good deals for high quality kitchens and appliances. You can buy your kitchen from the comfort of your own home instead of getting pestered by pushy salespeople. Check out HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supplier in Scotland. Someone was lagging and wait for me to come out of the club to shoot me. So he storming, storm past us, so I just stood in front of him like that. And he threw a punch at me. <laughs> so I just slipped it right and I bang, I hit him. With the right hand. I only hit him with the one. Bang, right. I knocked his two front teeth out. Grabbed his pint out of his hand, right. Poured it over his head, put it down while he was in it, and I fucking cracked him, flattened him right. Broke his nose and that, and, and all his mates. Whoa, whoa, we, whoa, we don't want it out. You know all mm-hmm. that shit. So as he got me, I hit him with two shots, bang, bang, and I hit him like that. Ah, it was like hitting a brick wall. So both hands broke. I knew, I knew, I knew I'd broke them. I knew it because I had like one shot, you know, like a yeah. splinter, yeah. which was one of my fingers. And I thought the pain was intense, my hands. But but when I hit him there. And he went down with all his weight on the tiled floor in front of the bar and bust his legs or his knee, he broke both legs anyway. The manageress said I'd worked in, she'd worked in the trade that many years. She said that was the first time she thought she had a death on her hands. And luckily for me at that very moment, the uh, ambulance was, was going up York Road and seeing what was going on and pulled straight over. And the paramedics worked, worked on him straight away and then got him straight to the hospital because mm-hmm. if that wasn't going by then I think he'd have died Boom, we're on we're today's on. guest we've got Street Fighter Richie, crazy horse, horsely. Nice to meet you, mate. How are you, brother? I'm all right. Oh, well, this is your first interview in what over fifteen years? Oh yeah, been a long time. Long yeah. Time. Never thought I'd do another one. I didn't want to, you know, but thought when you reached out to me uh, about five, six months ago, yeah. I said no, but I thought I watched some of your podcasts and I thought, yeah, go on, just do the one. I thought, yeah, because yeah, I read on. your book and it was very interesting, obviously. Over 150 street fights, which is mega, very well known man on the streets. And I was like, I need to contact you. And then you says, No, I, I felt, but I, I, somehow I knew you would yeah. contact again, <laughs> which is weird. As you know, me, I always go back to the start with my guests. I, I, I felt, yeah, when I was what I thought, he's a good guy, him. yeah, he's right as rain. So I thought, if I'm going to be interviewed with anyone. Yeah, I appreciate them. that because I know a lot of people try to get you on for their podcasts and mm. shows and you're not doing it. But again, synchronicity, brothers, the timing's right. So as you know, mate, I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, believe it or not, I'm, I'm a very private man. So with all this, you think he's not a private man. Yeah, yeah. Well, I started out as, a, well, I was given away as a baby. But uh, it was a bit strange because my mum and dad, they had a baby about well three years before I came into their lives and uh, she she passed away she was something wrong with her you know like kidneys and what have you lungs and that so and she, she died when she was about six months old so, and then they couldn't have no more kids but uh, my dad's old sister was called Roby and uh, she went to visit them one day and they were living down back near, near in a flat near the sea and uh Ruby said, she had a cup of tea, but have a bit chat, and she says, I'm going to tell you something, and you're going to think I'm crazy. I can see a pram outside your front door. There's a baby coming from somewhere for you two. My mum and dad thought, she's lost the plot there. So anyway, time went on. I don't know, six months, a year, whatever. 
Then uh, Ruby had called again to the flat for a cup of tea. She said, I'm going to repeat what I said last time. There's a pram, I can see a pram outside your front door and there's a baby coming from somewhere for you to. Mark my words. And I just thought, she's, she's lost the plot, she's got to have. How can we get a baby? We can't, it's impossible. Well then one day, not long after, well, I don't know how long, but not long after, my mum was walking down the street and she bumped into an old friend she'd never seen for years, but she she worked with her when she was 16 in the bottling plant. And uh, this woman was pushing two little girls in the pram. And she says, have you got any kids? She says, well, I had one, but she passed away a few years ago, blah, blah, blah. She said, I'm pregnant again. You can have this if you want, because I don't want it. I said, really? Swear to you, are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. I don't want it. I'm pregnant again. And that's how it started. So when she went in to have the baby, which was me, my mum and dad went up and seen her and blah, blah, blah. You, you're not... Because there was nothing... Didn't go through the courts or wasn't legal. And she says, yeah, you can have this baby. You're taking this baby home. And when, you go, when I go home... So she was in six days. Mum and dad went up to the hospital when she was coming out. They dropped her off at home. I think they got a taxi or whatever. They dropped her off at home and they, they took me and that was it. So when when she, I didn't want to say her name, when she, well, I can't get on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Called her Violet. So because she had the baby, which was me, mm -hmm. she had to register us, didn't she? So she went and registered me, so... Then, when she got the birth certificate, she went and gave me mum and dad them. And then they just changed my name to Richard Horsley, because they were Horsley. But uh, on my birth certificate, it's got a totally different name, Stephen. Mm -hmm. So they put Stephen as my middle name. So Ruby, my dad's sister, who was saying, there's a pram outside your front door, there's a baby coming from somewhere for yours. How spot on was that? Is she a medium? Or anything? She was a medium, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is media. nuts. So you were given away at birth, and yeah, but my coming must have been known by spirit. Yeah, because we'll touch on Summit, that. Yeah, you later know. on in the interview, you're very spiritual, and you read the kind of same stuff I read, like um, many lives, many masters. You're also a Reiki master, the same as myself. So you're very spiritual. Even your house is beautiful. It's very calming. So even for that early age, you must have had the gift. You've just never really utilised it through all your madness but now you're in a good place yeah, you're yeah. feeling mind strong so how was when did you find this story out what age uh, I don't know I think it was like maybe in, as I was getting older but I was told from being five year old that I, I was adopted they said my mum and dad told me I was adopted when I was five but I was mad about the Lone Ranger then. And, you know, the Lone Ranger had yeah. two guns on his hip. Mm -hmm. Cindy, well, we went to see all these special kids and we picked you out, so a new cup. We took you home. Waiting for my reac reaction, I just looked at him and said, did I have my guns on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like the Lone Ranger. But uh, I, d I grew up in a really happy, loving home, my mum, dad and me. And it was just absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. There was no, no, I didn't want for it, even though we had nothing. I didn't want for anything. Love, can't, you can't buy love, you can't put yeah. a price on it, and that's what we had in yeah. that house. Love because, is all you need. Love obviously, because yeah. my dad was nearly, well, about 40 when he adopted me. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just had a, just got magic memories, you know. How was your that. your teenage years? Can I, can I just yeah, get of course. back to that? Yeah, of course you can. I just want to go back to that, so... Fantastic growing up, mm -hmm. but that Ruby, my dad's sister, used to ask for me when, when you go to my granny Horsley's, my dad's mum, and uh, I'd like Richard to come to see me. Can he? Can he come and see me? So I'd go. I'd go and see her. She used to sit me in a chair in front of her and look into my eyes. Right, her eyes were piercing. Obviously, she was in touch with Summit, and she was getting told Summit, but. And and she used to talk about things to me. Well, I was just a young kid. I mm -hmm. didn't know what was going on. But I used to say stuff to her. 
like where'd that come from and I used to talk about healing and stuff like that when she thought well he's going to be a healer when he grows up that lad but obviously <laughs> more of a fighter mm. um, I'll break your bones and I'll heal him afterwards yeah <laughs> which is crazy but, isn't uh, it? it's awful so so she was like your auntie yeah yeah do you feel like she was maybe a spirit guide for you I don't know but it was just like strange but when she used to ask for me after like I went a few times but she used to frighten me because mm. why did you say that I used to say why did you say that who told you to say that why you know things like that mm -hmm. and I used to say I don't know it just comes out I don't know so and then I stopped going when I used to go to my granny to say oh Ruby wants you to see you I, oh, I'm not going <laughs> I'm not going scared <laughs> yeah I used to be frightened of it because yeah. uh, oh, oh, no, I'm not going there no more yeah it's crazy the powers that people can have and yeah. some people don't believe in it but until you actually see it, until people actually tell you things that are going to happen, yeah. then when they happen, you go, wait a minute, there's something yeah. in this. Yeah. Because I believe I'm protected by other entities and spirits. I go to, I've go, i got friends who are mediums now and, and they tell me things and say, you're just protected because all the people I've lost, that you're protected, don't ever worry. Yeah. That people are with you. And sometimes it scares the shit out of you, especially if you're <laughs> in the house alone as well. And, <laughs> You, you think, oh, sh 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 your mind can and start you wandering. Yeah. You f feel something. Yeah. I, I feel things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking behind you. Because they say everybody has the gift. Everybody has a gift. I, I it's believe. just tapping into yeah, it, isn't it? Yeah, tapping into it. Some people Becoming are too aware scared to. Like, yeah, and people think it's a... Because yeah. like we talked about earlier, you go to uh, infant school, then mm -hmm. junior school, senior school, you're just programmed to think a certain yeah. way. You're not not allowed to think outside conditioned oh, yeah. you're conditioned yeah and if people speak out about this kind of stuff especially a man as tough as yourself people think he's losing his nut they do <laughs> so, you, so you just keep it to yourself and you yeah. don't you don't speak about yeah. it to anybody because yeah. they'll think he's on the twist yeah. he's lost the plot him but again you can feel the presence in the house how calm it is so obviously it's clearly something right and the stuff that I'm doing as well I feel amazing I'm doing great things so it's working for me yeah. I might not necessarily agree with everyone but what I'm doing is good. I'm not harming anyone. I feel yeah. good. So, yeah, maybe there is something in all the spiritual stuff and the healing and the positive energy. And yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good place to be. So you had a very loving life. I aunt. loved it. Yeah, and uh, I was... My dad loved his football, so I mm -hmm. was crazy about football. What team? Me, Leeds United. Yeah. I was... Because they were brilliant at the day. Yeah. And then I was just mad about Leeds United. Mm -hmm. Loved Leeds United. Uh, and also I love Gordon Banks. Mm -hmm. I love Gordon Banks. Yeah. All I wanted to do was be a goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. So my dad would take shots at me outside on the grass. Save this one, Banksy. Save that one, Banksy. And I'd be diving all over saying that. Mm. But yeah, just really good memories, you know. Then. But that's a good thing to go back and have a loving memories and really peaceful memories because a lot of people have trauma for your age and yeah. thinking about yourself and the, the reputation you had, you would probably think you're raised up in a... Yeah, a, a, yeah, a abusive a, a house or yeah, a yeah. violent house to be but ruthless yourself. Totally yeah, totally that's crazy, that isn't yeah. that? So, I was thinking, where the hell did all this fighting come from? Mm -hmm. I wasn't raised that way, you know, but it just happened. It just, yeah, you, you, yeah. We'll, we'll get into that. In a yeah, minute, yeah, but, yeah. So, so at the first, I remember watching the football all the time. FA mm -hmm. Cup final was a big thing in our house. My dad was football crazy, and I always remember my very first England game was. Watching them get the lost three one to West Germany, three one at home. Banksy left three goals and I was devastated. Right, <laughs> but one of them was a penalty and he was uh, he saved it, but it went in off the post. And I was going, I was saying, oh, why? My dad said he has to stand on the line soon. He has to stand on the line. He can't. I said, well, can he just stand a little bit in front? And then he would have saved that. I said, no. I googled that not long ago to see what date and it was April 1972 that and I thought my god mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that that far back nearly 50 years ago yeah and so like I was football crazy and played for the school team I went to Grange at that time uh, uh, Grange was the closest school yeah and, and I was always a I always thought I was a good kid but I did have a f my first fight in the junior uh, in the infants was with a lad who I still know today. He was like a bull. It was called Smile, I believe it or not. Uh, Smile Dowson. He's a he's a he's a canny lad, mm -hmm. but, but he was like unbelievably strong for his for his age. And you know when everyone's fighting at playtime, having fun fighting and all that, and it just got serious. 
and the smile will come for me to do me damage. And you know, and it just, I, I got my, like Please. a shock. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so as he got older, me, I thought, if he gets older, me, I'm not going to get him off because he was a really strong lad. So just as he got close, I went, bam, bam, bust his nose. I don't know how I got through it. One toes. Didn't know about that. And then as you come in again, bam, bam, blow the nose went and then like the play the teachers and that straight in because they're, they're mm -hmm. in the playground when they with the bells and all that. Broke us straight up. I remember standing outside the the head's office waiting to go in to see the head. Shite myself. <laughs> I was all, I, mum always had shorts on me, so I always had a pair of shorts on. I had blood on my hands off his nose and blood on my legs. My knees were shivering like that, like that. You know, and that was uh, that's my first memory of any mm. fight. And then, like, what was the feeling when you, your first fight? Were you excited or did you have a buzz? I, I was terrified. Yeah, yeah, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. I was terrified. And then, I think not long after that, I maybe was about seven, and there was a lad two years older than me. Which is, when you're from seven to nine, that's a massive difference. Yeah, he used to pick on me all the time, and I used to run in, cry, and. Uh, Mum and Dad used to say, get out there, start, you know, learn to stick up for yourself. Stop running in here crying all the time. But two years is a big difference. I'm thinking, oh, he'll kill me, he'll kill me. And every time he see me, he'd bat me and go you know, out like that and I'd run in crying. Mm -hmm. This one day, I don't know what happened, I just, someone came over at me. And when I seen him, the street, I shouted, I just shouted names at him and all that, like a red rag double bull. He came storming after me. Right, because it was a sunny day, and my mum and dad were sat on the uh, on the uh, on the step. There was a few steps. They were sat on there and enjoying the sunshine. So that's probably where I got a bit of courage from, mm -hmm. thinking he's not going to hit me where these are. And as he as he got close and see mum and dad on the step, he, he stopped it, but he still came for me and he slowed down to a walk. And he came for me. I thought he's going to hit me here, and I knew he was. But as he got in reach, I fucking bang, I put this right hand. I hit, and I always remember hitting him right on the ear there. Mm -hmm. And he was in shock. But his, his eyes just filled up with water. And he was holding his ear like that. And I think he was in shock. And he, and he walked away. I couldn't believe what I'd done. My mum and dad were like over the moon. And mm -hmm. that was like my first fight. I'd like, uh, yeah, you know, one. slaying the dragon yeah, type yeah, of thing. Like, like, get a bit of power then. About a power but, uh, you, you I know didn't it. know how to throw a punch. Yeah. But my dad used to uh, used to sit in the chair, you know, and he used to say, Come here, son. So I'd sit in the chair and he'd say, How oh, hit me? So I'd try and hit him and he'd be blocking and slipping this and he'd laughing and blocking him. And I'd think, I just couldn't hit him, you know, like a couple of years I couldn't hit him. So I, I'd try and faint and, and then catch him with something else. But it, it was just. I never ever got him. So I'd punch him on the arms and that, and they'd just go, oh, get them flies away mm -hmm. from me. You know, so things like that. And uh, then my mum got cancer. My mum was bad with cancer. And uh, she was in Newcastle for a month or six weeks or something. How old were you then? I was about six, seven. Still young. Still dead young, yeah. So my dad we used to go and visit her through Newcastle. Obviously, didn't want me to go through while she was going through all that bad yeah, treatment. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, w <laughs> I would go to my granny Horsley's, who was freaking 80 then, you know what I mean? She was 80 year old. She was a, she, her mother was a Macintosh from Inverness. Yeah. Yeah. So, she, she had the name. Scotch in them. And, uh, and uh, she lived to like 96, her old granny. She'd been through the First World War, the Second World War, you know, she'd mm -hmm. seen a lot of changes. I always remember her sitting in that chair. She used to have a bowl of Scotch porridge yeah, yeah, every yeah. day, and she'd always have a cup of tea with a bit of whiskey in it <laughs> every single day. Mm -hmm. Ninety six when she died. Yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable. And uh, obviously, I had other family and cousins and that. And my, my dad's other sister, she had a, a, a family of four, and one of them became like a world famous rock star mm -hmm. well, we used to go around when I was a kid and visit them and the oldest son oh I called him Yannick because she married a Polish man and uh, Bob who was a lovely bloke Yannick bring your guitar in and 
give them a chance. So my nanny was only young then, but mm. he was like about six, seven years older than me. But he was like banging this tune. I think, my God, how can he play that good? Anyway, years and years later, he went. He joined Iron Maiden. He's been an Iron Maiden for thirty years now. That's unbelievable. Yeah. So, did you ever try and reach out to your mum or anything? At this, when you got older, as well. I did because well, it was wasn't till I was nineteen. Mm-hmm. But before then, uh, like my mum had always been in touch with her. Still, just to find out how you are and stuff. Yeah, just yeah, just like. Obviously, she had to sign Deep Pool papers because mm-hmm. when I got my name changed officially by Deep Pool, because she was classed as the mother, she had to sign them officially. So when I got my name changed to Richard Ross, it was only by Deep Pool. So there was no like official adoption or nothing like mm-hmm. that. But because they wanted to know where the ba- this baby was, where Violet had, where's this baby? So the social services would come out and visit me once every six months were, and seeing I was like getting looked after and great and yeah but me, we for all the we didn't have now we never went without now I always remember my dad having a sheep's head in the pan a pig's head in the pan cutting rabbits up on the table and, and making rabbits too and all that and I, I always remember uh, having a, a sheep's head eyeball stuck to my hand screaming get it out get it mm-hmm. out you know what I mean mm-hmm. but Good fun, great days, you yeah. know. How was your teenage years? Teenage years, but uh, well, just before I want my teenage years, yeah, me, about me, 13 uh, to well, 18, just before 19. that, my, my, my dad died. So, you lost your mum and your dad? Not my, my dad, uh, my mum survived the cancer, okay, and then my dad was getting problems with his kidneys. Mm-hmm. So, my mum had just survived cancer and my dad was getting problems with his kidneys, so they had to go through to Middlesbrough three times a week on the bus because no one had cars then mm-hmm. for dialysis. So I would go to Granny Horsley's or I would go to here or go to there. Just So that was going on for a bit. So the council said, we can't have this going on like that. But it was through the hospital. So they said, we'll have to get in a three-bedroomed house and uh, do the back bedroom out as a, a room to, you know. Yeah, machines and stuff. Yeah, they're all that. And uh, what was I was saying there? The, about uh, your dad? No, I know about the, but the... Yeah, the dialysis. The dialysis. I keep... Pff, yeah. The dialysis, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they saw the... You had the dialysis machine, you had all the things, all the tubes and that, and every life just went on as normal as possible, you know. Mm-hmm. And then obviously... One day he just well, it wasn't working no more, and he just became really ill, ill, and then he died. So, how old were you? I was ten, coming up eleven. You no, know, I was in the last yeah. year of uh, primary school. junior school, going into yeah. senior school. So it was a tough age to lose a, a just father figure. It ripped me heart out. Yeah, some something like a piece of me died that day. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It was just it ripped me heart out that, and I went like, I was like. Couldn't stop crying at his funeral, yeah. and uh, I just for ages after I just went into a shell. I couldn't be bothered with anyone and didn't want to make friends. So when we moved into the jumped into the yeah, senior it? school, I didn't. Uh, everyone wants to know who's the best fighter in the school, the first year, and, and you all make new friends. I wasn't interested. I wanted to just keep myself to myself. You know what I mean? Because mm. I was still grieving. Were you angry? I wasn't angry. I was just went in within myself a bit withdrawn, a bit like mm-hmm. introverted type of thing. And uh, I didn't know, but I, at the time, but now you, you get child bereavement counsellors and mm-hmm. all that. I mean, that would have done me the world of good then. That's what I needed. Someone to sit down, talk to me and explain explain things to me. And, you know, I think I would have handled it better than saying, I just phew, proper... Proper ripped me out of that. Yeah. But towards the end of first year, the uh, seniors, that's when I started to uh, come out, Michelle, you know. Did you rebel? I didn't rebel, but I remember, uh, I, I forgot about this fight, but oh, Kevin reminded me of, remember that fight in Jutland Road, blah, blah, blah. 
So why didn't you put it on your book? I forgot about it. I, do, I was just like, starting to come out and then I had a fight and jolting involved this lad who was few we had all of them, mate. And uh, he snaked me twice, two big shots, one under the eye and one in my lips. So <laughs> my eye was open, my lips were open. And we were battling and jolting and rolling, I beat him. And uh, so that was near, not not far off my birthday, around about the summer of 76. Yeah. And I was, uh, I, I excelled, you know, at uh, the 100 metres hurdles. Mm -hmm. So I'd done that. And I ran for the school. I had about five races for them, won them all. And I went in the town championships, right? I thought, hey, oh, this is it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got to the final, mm -hmm. right? Not the final. You were just waiting for the gun to go off. There was eight, eight in the race. Waiting for the gun to go off. I think, fucking hell, where's this gun at? And then my mind wandered a bit, and as my mind wandered a bit, the gun went off, and everyone's waiting. Mm -hmm. I thought, shit. You know what yeah. I mean? So I come six out of eight. And oh, I thought, you're joking. Ah, that's me. Mm -hmm. My athletics career was over then. When did you start boxing? I started boxing. Well, I first got into boxing. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd we'd moved into a caravan for six months. I loved it up there. The caravan up Saint Carew. I loved yeah. it. Yeah, it was brilliant. Peace and quiet. It was just nice, right by the sea. Hmm. but the school was miles away, you know what I mean? The other side of town, so it was like an hour to get to school, you know, getting buses and that. Mm -hmm. So on boxing gyms were the other side of town, so how I got into boxing. Yeah. My mum got on with a bloke called Ken then, and we were living in the caravan, and obviously Ken used to get a paper every day, so I used to look, read the spot at the back, and there was this big fight coming up that, got my attention and I used to read it all and read it all and bit. I thought hey this is going to be a cracking fight this and it was John H. Tracy versus Dave Boy Green that was the fight and I thought well what's on the radio at such and such I'm going to oh, I'm going to listen to that I can't wait for this so I put the radio on at that time and listened into the big fight with them two my god it just it was unbelievable Mm. The fight was fantastic. That took you to another world, that. You were actually in there. There was Ari, Ari Carpenter, the commentator. You were actually in there. You could hear the, you know, the microphone. You could hear the punches land, bang, mm. bang, mm, mm, and all that. I think, my God, it was in the, in the roar of the crowd. I think, my, that was unbelievable. And that was your listening to it on the radio? So I could imagine, yeah, and, I, and that's what triggered my imagination. Mm. And I could imagine going back years to the days of Joe Lewis and all them when there was no TVs, when they used to all sit round the radio, loads of them, listening to the fight. I bet that was magic, because mm -hmm. that was magic, listening to that. Using then I, your imagination. Then, of a yeah, and then, I, then I, watched the, I watched the fight on Sports Night. What a fight. It's one of my favourite fights. I love mm -hmm. it. And that was what I, I started with the boxing. But the, I went once with uh, my cousin now, Michael, and uh, to do a bit of training, but, it was in the town hall then, and there was, there was a boxing gym in the town hall for some reason. I don't know how, how long it was there. I think it was a year or something. And I only went there once. It was just too much of a trek, you know, like the big trek to school and back. And then the big, it just wasn't enough hours in the day. So I left, I thought, I'll go back to that when I'm closer to the gym. So when we moved out of that caravan, it was just not long after Elvis died, we moved out. Everyone knows where they were when Elvis yeah. died. I was living on the caravan side. So not long after that, when we moved into the town, closer to the school, closer to the boxing gym, then I started going to the boxing gym, and I couldn't believe how brutal and hard the training was. Oh, man, it was a killer. The training was a killer. And you'd get in the ring. They'd put you in the ring with people who had a few fights, and they'd knock seven colours of shit out of you, yeah. you know. So you either took it, never went back, because a lot of people came in that gym who thought they were tough guys, got on the ring, got a good pace, and never seen them again. So you either took it and went back. So you used to take it if you wanted to box, take it, go back, take it, go back. And that's what was happening. But the, the training, I've never tried, done training like that. It was a killer. It was brutal training. and um, So I was training for a few months, and I was thinking... And then in that summer, the I think it was the son of the Daily Mirror ran every day, uh, a sports thing. 
everywhere. Champions, Joe Lovers, Rocky Marciano, all them. And I was reading them, and I was thinking, oh, brilliant, this. So then I was really hooked into the boxing. And uh, they were getting me medical to have a fight. But I was getting pains in my legs, in the bottom half of my legs, and, and I was touching my heel. My heel was in terrible pain. I didn't know what. Went to see the doctor, and there was something called Osgood Schlatter's disease, which, in layman's terms, you're growing too fast. And there were, all this was, all these tendons, this, that, and the other. So I had to have bandages on my knees for about six months, right? Mm -hmm. And a uh, quarter of an inch built up on me. Shows all the time, but I had Dublin boats then. They were all the go dealer boats and flares. Good job, flares were in because I couldn't have worn uh, drain pipes, could I? With yeah. bandages yeah. on me now. But so you're uh, growing that, too fast. Growing too what fast. Age were you? I was. Uh, was I was fourteen. I was fourteen. And I, and I was, eh, but I was it. So I had to. I got a doctor's note not to do no physical exercise for such and such. For so long, and I couldn't go do PE at school or nothing like that. So that's what happened. So by then, obviously, the discos and the youth clubs and yeah. all that was going down. So the boxing got put on the back burner while my legs were getting ready. I knew I was going to go back to it, but I was enjoying myself so much at the discos and and it was great and Greece came out and <laughs> Happy Days was on the telly yeah. the Fonz and you know all that yeah. it was just great times and then the leather jackets and the slick yeah. back yeah and then it switched to the punk rock and everyone ditched the old gear and the dying in their hair and spiking their hair up and punk rocks and everyone, I, I'll tell you what I've done I'll tell you what I've done I went to a, I went to a shop it was called the Nut House I was a hairdresser, and I got my hair cut, short. I got it dyed blonde, <laughs> right? And I got question marks dyed into it all over my head. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when we were walking on the people on the bus looking like that, they yeah, go, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm this idiot. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and that grew, grew straight out, like, but mm -hmm. uh, it was just like... What was that for? Uh, just because we were... It was just somewhat different, yeah. you know what I mean? And I was right into the Sex Pistols and... Punk was massive all over the town then. Then mm -hmm. I used to go to the discos, but when he used to go to different discos, there was always there was always a hierarchy at there and there and there. Like you go to this disco was full of bikers, and they hated the punk rockers. So there's always friction. You always end up fighting, and, or somewhere else, or you're on an, another patch. And we went out to town one day, one uh, one night to this uh, big punk rock disco, and the. They didn't like us at all. And I was bumping into us on the dance floor and all that. So when we got outside, they all followed us. So we all had a big fight outside. And uh, one of them ran over and stabbed the tyres on our van. Just one tyre. So one of the lads pulled his big <laughs> big chain out the back of the van and started wrapping it around the heads. There was hell on all over the place. Fights, sporadic fighting all over. All over. It was like Davy Crockett and, uh, at the Alamo, honest. Then the police pulled up the panda vans and that and they got hold of us and they says look eh, you know by the time they got the stories just in the street they said look eh, change that tyre and fuck off or you're going to get locked up that's what he said to us so I, I was only 14 then mm -hmm. 14 so so and the other lads were older obviously so we drove off and the the first Knuckle fight from about from 1979. I was, it was 79 or something. I was four. I was still 14 when I, I fought this biker. There was th three of them that came looking for me. And we had a bit of chill, so I was going to kick off anyway. And they came. They found me. Made me pal. So I said, "Yeah, let's fight." Oh, then yeah, let's fight. I'm fighting here. I'm not fighting here, mate. Let's. F so we found somewhere to fight. It was a Saturday afternoon. We found some wasteland. Which incidentally, a few years after that, became a, a health centre and a doctor's. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was getting ready. He was getting re ready to fight, and I was just stood there with a denim jacket on, you know, with the studs and this and the other, and the safety pins and that <laughs> sex pistol. <laughs> I was just unbuttoning each button like that, staring into his eyes, saying, "I don't give two fucks about your son." So I took my jacket off, handed it to me mate. 
and we squared up and he just jumped on me and tried to take me to the floor. We hit the, hit the floor and I rolled, I thought, I'm not getting bolt on this floor, I want to keep that range. So I managed to get up because he was wanting to gouge and all that shit. I got up and then just got him in range and bang at the mother jab, Oof. bust his nose, bang at him again. And I thought, I'll just move about him here. Because he didn't know what was going on here. He said, oh, a boxer, eh? I says, fucking, yeah, boxer. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I was moving about him, like, I thought, bang, I'll just soften him up with a jab, and then I'll I'll put a bad driver right hand into mm -hmm. him. And uh, just at that, these old women were shouting, shout, right? And, the, and within, like, seconds, of the bobbies must have been going past and flagged them down. So the bobbies came. And come running over, and the other lads scarpered, but me and him just stayed. I thought, well, we're just settling a dispute with mm -hmm. our fists, like, you know, you should do. And, uh Did you shake hands or anything? Well, the Bobby made us, do, uh, Bobby's interviewed us, both, why are you fighting, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to caution you now, but, right, name and address, blah, blah, blah. Richard Austin, blah, 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 blah. Uh, how old are you, son? How old? 14. When I said 14, <laughs> the biker said, oh, I? I didn't know you were only 14, mate. I wouldn't have thought you. I didn't know you were only 14. How old was he? 19. No way. <laughs> 19. Shit. He was embarrassed. Yeah. He was embarrassed, yeah. And I embarrassed him with him. Mm -hmm. So that was that. Uh, so you were, you were starting to become fearless where you're willing to fight anybody any age? Yeah. At 14. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I don't know where it come from. I just... Did. But then, you still had the fear. Yeah. You had the fear. Mm -hmm. You always had the fear because you always had the adrenaline. Yeah. You always but had then the you've got the issue, you've got the period with your mum being born and then you've got your dad dying. So you've also got your trauma there where you probably think the only thing you, you probably get a sense of relief yeah. and the pain taken away is fighting or and, and battling with people where you're winning and you're feeling good because then it becomes a lonely journey as well. Very lonely. Try to figure it out and and you've not got a father figure there who's always giving you love and attention. When they go, it's like the, the shackles come off as well. Yeah. And you don't know where to channel your energy. Yeah. Uh, my mum's... My mum got married by then to Ken. We'd never had no kids. The boxing but, guy? No. Uh, my mum married another a man called yeah, Ken. Yeah, yeah. They were really good together. They were really good for mm -hmm. each other. But I didn't get on with them. We clashed all the time. Yeah. I just thought, yeah, he's great for my mum, yeah, but I couldn't look at him as a dad, yeah, father yeah, figure, because yeah, yeah, yeah. that wasn't my dad, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? No one no one could step in his shoes as far as I was yeah. concerned. So Ken couldn't understand the way I used to go on. So I was just a, I don't know, I probably thought I was all right, but I was probably a little bastard. Yeah, think about but it. again, you're just thinking about your dad as another man in the house and you yeah. start... But again, if if they're happy, then that's the main thing. That's mm. the main reason that we can't stop other people being happy. But you're just thinking about the way you speak about your dad. You can you clearly love him. You yeah. clearly showed you a good life and a good path. And this is why you probably made all the changes to be where you are now. So when did it start slipping for yeah. you, though, when you were 14 and 15? When did you start getting into fights more often? Yeah, well, well when, then when I was just, I was fighting quite a lot. We just daft little street fights mm. here, there and everywhere. And... I always knew I was going to go back to the gym and I thought, oh, punk rock's fading out a bit now. I need to get back to the gym and channel my energy into boxing or something before, you know, something daft happens where I get locked up or yeah. I get charged with something. Well, actually, I did, I've just forgot about that. I got, did get charged with something. But it was only horse play because there was me and a few horse lads. Horse play with the name me, as well. <laughs> me and a few lads. Yeah. We went, decided to go titty picking Anyway, the first thing we come across was this massive air stack. Like a big bouncy castle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we, we were 13. We were just all jumping about on that, throwing bales of air to each other, just having a good laugh and all that. Then we were surrounded by farmhands and the farmer and the police got called and we got took to the police station and we got charged with uh, criminal damage of his air stack. And but, but the the... It was if the farmer wouldn't settle out of court because he was a magistrate and he wanted the compensation. Mm. So we all got 
six quid compensation <laughs> and a conditional discharge for the guy. For, for, for hay? Uh, for throwing a stack about. That's it. I don't know, I won't go believe it. Mm -hmm. And there was a big article in the in the paper. Horseplay, blah, blah, blah. Horseplay. Horseplay, yeah. Horseplay. That's crazy. So, yeah. So, anyway, when I went back to the boxing gym, after my legs were all right, and I thought, well, there was a lad in the gym, a really experienced lad. They used to paste me when I went the first time. I thought, I'll get in and have a go. I said, do you want a spa? He said, yeah, well, he was well experienced. He'd boxed all over, like Norway and Gibraltar, and you know, and he was for North East selection, really good. Had loads of probably about 100 fights, really good. Southpaw and all. I thought, right, I'm gonna get in there, I'm gonna really have a go and, and see see if I do all right. <laughs> so I, I didn't give no ground, and he didn't, and we stood slam banging at each other, right? And, it was, I don't know, the second round or the third round. The coach, he, he was bloodied and I was bloodied. And the coach says, right, that's enough. Gloves off. Gloves off before you kill each other. And when he said them words, I just thought, yeah, I've, I've like, I've, I've got some of you. Mm -hmm. Rather than take a bloody nose and think, oh, it's all right hitting somebody and you can't take it yourself. I could take it. Yeah, you've been, it's been says that you... And with an experienced yeah, guy and all. That you could take a punch. Oh, I had respect for. Yeah. Yeah, so... You're starting then, to get the buzz for boxing. Yeah, and I was still only 15 then. Mm -hmm. And obviously I left school at 15. I went straight to work, building a sea wall, you know, humping bricks all day for eight hours and then having to go to the boxing gym at night. You just take your fitness for granted as you're young, don't yeah. you? And then started fighting... But I was never dedicated. I was boxing. I had me. I went to work one day, getting a croggy on the back of someone's foot went through the spokes over the lip come up. I said a bit of a scab on my lip here, my lip was fat. And I had a fight lined up. And I thought, fucking shit, the fight's going to be cancelled now. Anyway, the coach, Duncan, said, uh, I've cleared it with the doctor, son, you're fighting. So it's a nice one. So when I when I was seeing the doctor, the doctor said, "It's our call, so." And she went, mm. and I said, and he smirked at me and winked at the doctor. So I boxed that night and uh, and I won. I thought great. Anyway, I, I get I get through to the the quarterfinals of the national championships. And the night before, one of my work workmates was getting engaged. So there was no monk-like things for me in bed early, ready for the big fight the next day. On the bevy. <clears throat> Pissed. At the, uh, no <laughs> sleep. <laughs> Pissed. How was the fight then? <laughs> oh, fighting the next day in the National Quarterfinals, I'm thinking, fuck. I, I remember walking up the steps to the ring and my stomach turned over and I'm thinking, fuck, hell, shape yourself mm -hmm. up, mate. You've got a big fight on your hands. Are you? and, and I'd done all right in the first round, I thought. Oh, I thought, I think I've won that first round. I sat on the stool and uh, Duncan said, It's frying to you, man. Get torn into him, it's frying to you. But uh, what I didn't realise at the time, he was his counter puncher. He was waiting for me to throw first. Yeah. And uh, and, and, and the south put awkward. And then obviously we just clashed. He caught me with his head and his elbow and that. And my eyes just went. <clears throat> and I, I was boxing. I just, you know, when you. I thought someone would throw a pint of lager or water or something in the ring and just because I just stared at it, the canvas. But I didn't realise it was my eye, it was my blood. By an elbow? I don't know, it was an elbow or a, or head. a, or a head. Was, mm -hmm. was so I went straight to the hospital, got six stitches. And then, How, why weren't you dedicated? Why do you say that? I don't, because the... <laughs> well, clearly the you're drinking the night before. The training was that hard. Mm -hmm. I wasn't used to it. I couldn't get used to the discipline. So that's why, and because you never looking went. back in hindsight, yeah. I should have dedicated my life to it. But I'd go from fight to fight without training, and, and never thing, actually yeah. get in the ring fully. Talent fit. will only get you so far, but it's the yeah. dedication that that will take you to the elite level, the next level. Yeah. Then then I I won three or four five on the row, and then I I was in the Northern Counties final. What weight were you fighting? Light heavyweight, 
12 and a half stone and I fought the British champion there uh, for big he was six foot three and he was knocking everyone out he was called Gary Crawford but when he turned professional he changed his name to Crawford Ashley he won he won uh, British European Commonwealth titles won a Lonsdale belt outright had three world title fights he was great a great fighter when I, when I fought him, he hit me in the right. He hit me with the right the pipe. With, oh. the, with the right hand. I thought he'd snap me neck and half. I cut. I was give. I give it that to the referee. <laughs> the referee. Uh. The referee started counting over me. And he, so because I wasn't stood like that, he just waved it off. So mm. it stopped by him, and then obviously, I was doing the the skinhead scene and all that then as well. So I'd, I'd left the gym alone for, it would be about six months. And I walked back in the gym, it was October. I remember walking in October because the season normally started beginning of October, boxing season, amateur boxing, like October to May normally. It used to be years ago anyway. So I goes in the gym, never been in for six months, nowhere near. Duncan, Duncan says, just the man, just the lad I want to see. I said, what? He said, I was going to come round your house after the gym tonight. What, see where I was? Mm. He says, no. He says, uh, will you fight Glenn McCrory on Thursday? I said, Glenn McCrory? Thursday? I said, I've not been in the gym for three, uh, six months. I said, three days away. I said, uh, I've got no chance. I said, where's it at? He said, uh, in concert, like on that, their own club show. Mm-hmm. I says, oh. I said, the only way I'll fight, Duncan. I says, phone back and tell him I want some money. I says, and I'll fight. But I <laughs> never got the yeah. fight, so he must have phoned back and said, cheap, you get it. Get someone else, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. But uh, then I fought. I fought in the championships again against, uh, it's, he, was, he was a lovely boxer, this lad. He was a big, tall, light, heavy, strong as a bull, right? And the lads come to me, one of the lads boxing come up to me, he said, fucking hell, Richie, I've just seen your opponent warming up. He said, fucking hell. I thought, yeah, what, well, and? Fucking hell, he's awesome. <laughs> I said, oh, thanks for the confidence poster, mate. Fucking, he's looking at me as if to say, he's going to fucking murder you. Yeah. So, so curiosity, mm-hmm. I popped round and I look, I was seeing him, I thought, and he looks tasty. Mm-hmm. He was putting them in. I thought, fast. I thought, he's really experienced, this guy. I thought, well, he's good. I thought, we'll see how good he is when I stick one on his chin. So, anyway, we were fighting. Bang, bang, bang. I was I was, I was, was landing something to the body, but the big shots I was trying to get on his head, he was, they were just missing him. And he, was, he just jumped on me. And fuck, bang, 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 let them go onto me. I, I took some, I was took some on the gloves, but I took some good head shots, but they didn't affect me. I was all right. And the referee jumped, stop boxing. One, two, I says, what are you giving me a count for? I am, I'm not even dizzy, what are you giving me a count for? He ignored me. Right, couldn't you? So, and he comes in again, bang, 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 and I'm firing back, bang, so we're, we were taught to tour. Then he, he, I think I was on the ropes and he hit me with about three, four, five shots. A few on the arms, a couple got through, right? Stop boxing! Referee. And I thought, this time I'm pissed off. I'm thinking, what are you telling me to stop boxing for? I've took, you know, there's no man on me. I've took a couple of head shots. It's box, you know. Mm-hmm. I had a bit of a rant at the referee. And then he just went, it's all over. I thought, you bastard. So I was filming. Mm-hmm. I was fucking filming. So ah, he, put, put, he, stopped, the he stopped me. He called the. He called it up. That's it. Probably because I wasn't stood there like that, mm-hmm. ready to box. I was fucking shouting at him, saying, "What are you stopping it for? What did I have, you know, what am you giving me count count for? Blah blah blah." And then he just waved it off. He must have thought, "You cheeky bastard! I'll get mm-hmm. you yeah, back." Yeah, yeah, all yeah. over. Mm-hmm. So on the way back home, oh, filming. And I said. Uh, I've had enough of this boxing lark, Duncan. It's fucking shit. I said, I've had enough. It's just piss take. I says, you can't take a punch to the head without them stopping the fight. What's the matter with them? 
you know, said, mm-hmm. oh, safety, blah, blah, blah. I says, I'm not my It's no good to me, this. He says, Richie, don't wrap in. He said, uh, I'll get you a fight, a return fight with him. I said, will you? He says, yeah, I promise. I says, right, I want that return fight. So he got us the return fight with him. <laughs> and it was up the collieries on their club show. So you're getting nervous, I think, we'll see if he does it again, he's better, he's a better man and we'll see a or afterwards. And so I get weighed in at the, at the show and, and I'm waiting for him and I see him come in, I thought, oh, stomach turned over that, oh, here he is. He spotted me, he come straight over to me. <laughs> he said, oh, I'm not fighting, mate. I says, why? He says, oh, I don't feel so good. He said, I'm not fighting. I said, ah, oh, you know. So, what I done, we just like hit it off. Mm-hmm. And he was right as I thought, I was kind of lad him. So, I was sat eat, drinking orange, drinking orange juice. And I sat next to him and we just sat, watched the show and we were just chatting away. And uh, what a canny lad. And that same lad, he, uh, he done pretty well and then he, Box at heavyweight, and he th- and he said, "Right, I want to put a bit more muscle on for heavyweight, get a bit more power." And he he had such natural symmetry, he was getting, he was just looking awesome. And he went into bodybuilding, so he went in the amateur shows, then became British champion and all that, turned professional. So left the boxing to go bodybuilding. Yeah, and he turned professional and was getting podium finishes and then uh, then he won Mr Universe as a professional and he won it five times in a row and he beat Arnold Schwarzenegger's record no way who was it Eddie Elwood he's called yeah mm. that's unbelievable oh yeah Amazing. so that's the guy who beat you at the boxing <laughs> and then he end up <laughs> yeah end up, end up friends yeah. is he still alive oh yeah he's got a gym down down the road yeah. there yeah I often pop and see he's, he's, he's a good bloke he's yeah. a really nice man but you know when they say about uh, bodybuilders can't fight because mm-hmm. some of them can't fight can't move they're just big stuff. muscle heads yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> he can fight can he still move I can he, mm-hmm. he he's, uh, he's yeah he was oh, oh, a magnificent specimen he was uh, about that wide when he was uh, I took my shoulder in so I can add the, oh, he, was, he was just unbelievable I want to see mm. him oh, good guy good guy and did you leave the gym then I left it for a bit and then I went to the pro gym. Yeah. I went to the pro gym after that. How did you get into like the... To- I just yeah, want to touch on bodybuilding yeah, just yeah. for a little bit. Yeah. A few little run-ins I've had with bodybuilders. Why? Uh, when I was I was about 19, mm-hmm. I used to smoke a bit of ash then. And my mates were in this nightclub, so I went to the nightclub. I was on my own. I was dizzy. And I thought... Phew. Knocked on the door. There was three doormen there. Let us in, and there was a, there was a doorman, big muscle mutt, sat behind it, taking the money. He'd said something to me, and I called him a, like a daft cunt or an mm-hmm. idiot or something, you know, like, and he went, he must have had a right brain. Yeah, what? Jumped up, lifted the thing, grabbed hold of me, right? I was like 12 and a half stones, and he, and he threw me through these double doors, through the double doors, and I just skidded on my ass. <laughs> <laughs> And then he comes storming after me, and the other two doormen shut the doors behind him. And I'm on the, the days on the floor, thinking, bloody mm. hell. If he kicks me in the head, here I'm knackered. But he didn't. He, he done me a favour. He picked me up, he slammed me into the wall, knocking the wind out of me. And then he slammed me into the other wall. And I'm like, trying to get me bare and something. I'm freaking out. You know, and then. He just slammed me a couple of times, and and as he came in this third time, I caught him right on the chin with the right hand, and he went down. But I was just stood staring at him, just stood like half limp, looking at him, and he and he just looked up at me like that, saying I wasn't going to do nothing else. He got up, pushed himself down, looked at me like that, and went. Walk back in the club and shut the door. And I, I walked away and half a day thinking, my God, I was lucky to get, I was lucky to get away with that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
Yeah, there's later another couple of couple of muscle mutts. Uh, one of them staring at me all the time. I was working the door. So I waited for them to go and they walked past me. And there was this one in particular just staring at me. And as he walked past, he stared at me. So I followed him out in the street. He says, oh, yo. I can't remember the exact name. I called him. I called him somewhat to, mm -hmm. to you know, like, mm -hmm. fire him up. And he, he turns around. He, and anyway, he come at me. I, 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 I'm trying to think of the words I actually said to him. I called him. I called him somewhat mm -hmm. to rile him up. And then he, he, he just ran at me. And I knew he was going to grab me around the waist. So I measured him because it was just all happened so quick, see. So and he, and he come, I just hit him with this right uppercut. Bang, hit him right, bang. And that was him, he was on the floor, ghost. And I said, yo, pick your fucking mate up and, you know, go mm. type of thing. And I went back in the back in the club. And I give him five minutes. I walk back outside, see if they were still there. They were gone. So when I went back in the club, looked at me again. Those false tan all over me knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> that was false yeah, tan on yeah, my yeah. knuckles. <laughs> did, did you think you, you always like to pick that, people who God. are big and strong and older than you as a challenge? Me? No, I never used to look at people as a challenge. The, they, they used to look at me as a challenge. I never yeah. used to, I want to fight you. Mm -hmm. It was always, they'd want to fight me. <laughs> yeah. And the, 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 there was another lad. Another another professional bodybuilder who, mm -hmm. like, years later, him and his wife apologised to me for this night. I was at a party this night, and uh, he was he was there selling cocaine. The big I am, chip on his shoulder, the lot ripped to death, mm -hmm. going around just stipulating people, just being a piss take and taking the piss out of people. Try and, and, and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, selling cocaine, but just. Yeah. You know, just being a wanker. <clears throat> and I said, do you? I says, calm it down, man. Stop like, taking the piss. I says, because I'll take it outside and I'll knock your fucking head off. He looked at me. I says, yeah, will you? I says, yeah, outside. So we went outside. <laughs> yeah. So I went outside and I hit him with his right hand. Like, but I, I put my right hand right through his head like that. Big, strong lad like that. You need to put it right through his head and he was gone. Just, just only the only one shot. And he was delayed, grown, gone, finished. And I thought, I'm going. Because you don't hang about yeah. when, if people call the play, oh, done it, him. You know, so yeah, I, I went. But years later, I, him and his wife came up to me some somewhere in a club or somewhere and said, and said hey, I'd like to apologise for that night. You know, he said, what a wanker I was. But, and you made me see what a chip on the shoulder I had. Hmm. And... Uh, and I changed my ways after that. Stopped being a prick and blah, blah, blah. And his wife says, thank you. I want to thank you because after that night, he changed as a person. Brought down a couple of yeah. pegs. Yeah. Is that when you started getting your reputation from the streets? Well, I, I had a, repu a bit of a reputation, but not a reputation as the men man. Mm -hmm. But because I was still young then, I had a re reputation with people of my same age. Yeah. And uh, but uh, there was this other guy who was a really good scrapper. I had a fight outside the club with him because he was going around knocking Darman out, and he would come to our club, and I wouldn't let him in. And there was a bit of ruckus, and he says to me, "Me and you in the middle of the road." So we had the fight in the middle of the road, me and him. Mm -hmm. But everyone would have given me if it was like arranged and said. Oh, these two are fighting on Thursday. Everyone would say, fucking hell, he'll kill Richie, he'll kill Richie. But I fucking butchered him, I pagged him outside. Mm -hmm. And people were saying, fucking hell, did you say that? Did you say Richie, do him? And, and like your reputation was Starting gone like to that. Because I know like, uh, Brian Cockrell is a good friend of you. What about for, uh, Lee Duffy? Did you ever come toe-to-toe -to -toe with him at any point? Because I know he had a big reputation down this neck of the woods. He did, yeah. Well, well, a lot of my friends knew Lee, and, mm -hmm. and, and and a pal. Well, when I knocked that lad out that night, but I've just said that George. Mm -hmm. When I was working with a lad called Andy, and he was a good pal of Lee, and uh, he used to do business with him. And he used to go through to see Lee and all that. And he'd, but there was no mobile phones out then. And he used to say, he used to talk about Lee. He said, "I'll come round your house on day when I'm going through, and I'll take the old meet him." 
But every time he came to our house, I was never in. Mm-hmm. And there was no like texts and saying, I'll be around in 10 minutes, I'm going through. There was none of that. And then one day he'd said, because one day he'd said to me, yeah, I came to your house the other day. I was with Lee. We just called him the off chance there was no one in. I thought, so I, I never met him, you know yeah. what I mean? But uh, I started going to the pro gym. I was boxing in the pro gym and uh, sparring with the pros like Paul Spike Foster and Phil Gibson and that. And, you know, big Dave Garside. Mm-hmm. Well, he was a he was a heavyweight contender then. Big, a big lad, uh, 16 stone or something. Big Dave, well experienced. I think he was in the top 10. He, and he says to me, let's have a few rounds, Richie. I says, I'm 12 and a half stone, man. I says, I'm getting in there with you. You'll punch holes in me. He says, says, no, we'll just have a move round, take it easy. So I've done a few rounds with Dave and uh, he was took to his word. And, uh, but that gym was great. It was excellent getting, Mm -hmm. you know, when the big fights were coming up. It was just being in the gym where the lads were training for the big title fight and this, that and the other was George Feeney, John Feeney. Billy Hardy, all them. It was just a great atmosphere, and I enjoyed going. And then I got I got my first house, and it was right up right over the road from George Feeney. <laughs> I can't believe it. Mm. So when George was training, George won the British title, didn't he? Got they got fight of the year, and uh, come over the hour house with the Lonsdale belt and all that, and got some photos took. God knows where them went. But uh, on the back of that fight, George got a fight with the American well, well lightweight champion, Ray Boom Boom Mancini. Yeah. And it was in Italy, but it was live coast to coast across Italy, America and all that. And because George lived over the road, I says, I'll come and do road work with you on the morning. So I used to go do road work with him three times a week. And he'd... He would do eight mile and I'd do four mile, you know, over the sand dunes and all yeah. that. Oh, it'd kill me that. So I do used to do that. And then mm-hmm. the big fight in Italy for Boom Boom Mancini. Well, Mancini was wanting a 10 round title fight to warm up because his last fight, he, he killed the Korean, didn't he? Uh, went in the 14th round and he, and he died in the ring. They carried him out of the ring and, and he never regained consciousness. So Mancini wanted a, a 10 round warm up. Feeney needy beat him. He had him rocking all over in the eighth round. And so they loved him in America then, George. So he had got this big, he got a big fight after that with uh, Howard Davis, who was the number one Olympic gold medalist, number one contender for the title. And, and him and George fought, and the winner got the title shot. And uh, but Howard Davis was such a beautiful boxer. George couldn't get near him, and but I, and he outboxed him at long range. When I used to run three times a week with George for that mm-hmm. fight as well, so I became Did that get you friends with George. Yeah, excited when you seen them going for being contenders and potentially going oh, for world yeah, titles. Man. Did it, do, you, do you regret not giving it yeah, your I full just, potential? I just yeah, but to see how I knew far you went. I would have loved to have been me, but I didn't have the dedication or mm-hmm. to do what they were doing. You know what I mean? Mm. Living like a monk. Like everything's set, you can't, you can't have this, you can't have it. Like there, John, I remember there. What was your weekly routine like then? I'd just go what, when work, I wanted. Working, boxing, fighting. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I wasn't working the doors then. I was just that come like a couple of years later before, after uh, the Mancini fights and mm-hmm. all that. But there's a good story to this, the Mancini fight, because many years later, I think it was thirty odd years after they'd fought them two, George. There's a friend down there, Wolverhampton. That's this big uh, sportsman's place. Gets all the sports personalities over. He was getting bone bone Mancini over. Got in touch with me. He says, I'd love it if you could bring George Feeney in for this uh, VIP night with bone bone Mancini and get them to meet for the first time since the fort. So I did. And George took his Lonsdale belt. And what a fabulous night, five uh, five course meal. It was just what a, an amazing night it was. And they got uh, they, they got on like house on fire them so George and uh, mm-hmm. Boom Boom. It was brilliant, good memories. That's some name on it, Boom Boom. Boom Boom, yeah. Well, he, he was a convert at Southport, mm-hmm. really. 
that's why I had such a wicked left hook. Boom, mm-hmm. boom, Mancini. What age did you start working on the doors? I was 23. I was... So still young. Yeah, I was... Uh, what I was doing, I, I was... I was at the boxing gym fighting. I was everywhere then. Mm-hmm. For uh, Outen Manor. And uh, my pal... With the, with the coach, who I'd known many years, was was working the doors, and he was saying, why don't you come work the doors, man? Why don't you come work the doors? I'm thinking, ah, yeah, working the doors, no, it's not for me. He says, come down, man, it's right, there's rain, there's hardly any fights. No. I said, ah, you, you get this much a night. No, no, I think, mm, could be tempted, could be tempted. So I was fighting as heavyweight. I had a few fights as heavyweight. And then the uh, TV cameras came because you know we needed sponsors and that you know to mm-hmm. to travel about to this fight and that fight and they'll do so they made an appeal on the tv if there were any sponsors and that and i was on the punch bag in the background bang 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 and i had this fight lined up right? and it was mm-hmm. something like, like the local news all this so i went to this fight and uh the club turned up and said uh Where's the heavyweight at? Oh, he hasn't turned up. He said, uh, he's not fighting him. <laughs> not fighting him. On the, that's him on the telly. He says, he's not fighting him. You know, because seeing me on the... He must have been watching that Look North programme. Mm-hmm. Seeing me on the punch bag and said, that's him, I'm not no. fighting him. He never turned up. Mm-hmm. Shake bag. <laughs> so then I, I worked on the doors with the lads. And it was a good... It was a good uh, atmosphere, but it was a really... It was at that time where it was just bouncing everywhere. We had the bottom floor to look after the top floor, and it was just heaving constantly. Mm-hmm. So you had like five or six lads on, a couple, two or three on downstairs, and two upstairs, just making sure everything was right. And but you get a few fights, but everything was sound. But we always have queues outside, and the lads learn me out to, I learned how to stop the queue in there. Mm-hmm. You know, you yeah, just yeah, learn yeah. the tricks of the trade, not there. Yeah. So I enjoyed that and. And then I, I just, uh, I was training for the ABAs. I was, I was going in the ABAs at heavyweight, and and I trained hard for it. And I thought, I'm really going to give it a shot again. And I had a few fights on the doors, and I thought, I'm going to. I've always dreamed of winning the ABA title. And I thought I'm going to have a go, big go. Then I fought this, oh, this strong as an ox guy from Sunderland, just came at me like a bullet from a gun, throwing everything at me, bang, bang, bang. Anyway, I dropped him, I stopped him. And he was supposed to be in the ABAs as well. But uh, when I got the ABAs, I did, that day, we were 10 minutes late for the win, and the wooden has win. So there was a big argument at the scales. You're not weighing in. What, you, you've had your letter? I said, letter, what letter? I said, every club got a letter, they had to be here by a certain time, or the, the weren't getting weighed in. Mm-hmm. I said, First time we'd heard about any letter. But afterwards we found out that there was a letter, but the letter was sent to the Outen Manor Club instead of sending it to the coach. They sent it to the Outen Manor Club. So the whoever was in charge of the Outen Manor Club opened the letter, uh, boxes have to be such and such, uh, put in the drawer and tell nobody about it. So my ABA dream was mm-hmm. over. Go on. What happened? What did your life happen after I that just, then I was just bouncing all the time and yeah fights how long on a street fight how long what's the longest fight you've ever had longest fight they're normally over quick <laughs> just knocking people out for <laughs> no, fun no they're, they're, they're normally over quick you normally yeah. you don't see many street fights that last very long only if you do if they're laying on the ground pulling each other's hair or mm. you know not much action going on. So I've I've yeah. seen people sat out one laid on the floor, the other one on top of them, both holding each other's air for about half an hour. Yeah. Thing. That's not a fight. That's not Pathetic. fighting. Yeah, 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 yeah. A fight is you just mm-hmm. get stuck in, bang, bang, bang. And normally when you're taking big shots at with nothing on your hands, bang, bang, bang. Not many people will take them shots. Yeah, how can you how did so, you get to take such a hard dig? How can you take punches? How are you? So, because you get conditioned in the boxing gym, because you get that many punches in the boxing gym, you mm. get smashed all over that boxing gym. 
and you've got to take it. So even though it hurts a lot when you get mm-hmm. smashed without a, a glove on, you're used to it because you're used to the you you're used to getting like your brain scrambled and and, you, and you, your senses all over. Mm-hmm. You're used to that, but other people are not. Who've never been in the boxing game? Yeah. Gym getting. Have you still got so your some, teeth. Yeah. You still got all still your teeth. Still got them all. Yeah. How's that? Did you wear a gum shield or anything when you was doing yeah, a street yeah. fight? Oh no, 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 no. I'm street fight, no. But uh, you have still got them all. Like you must have strong well, teeth. Well, there's a lot of them. Yeah, come yeah, out, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Because I've got a sweet tooth. <laughs> Do you remember your toughest fight? They always say toughest fights, but I think the, the toughest tough. fights are always in the gym. Mm-hmm. You don't get no tougher fights than what you do get in the gym. Like, you've had brain damaging fights in the gym, you know, like, what you think, fucking hell, clout, everyone just smashed mm-hmm. all over. You're thinking, this, someone watching think, this is barbaric, this, but that's how you learn to absorb punches and, to, and mm-hmm. toughen yourself up for, like, when you're in a situation. So, and, uh, I moved from that place, I went, I went you know, I was working in another place, a uh, mm-hmm. bar downstairs and a uh, bar upstairs. This is when the pump up the jam. Uh, you know, yeah, all that, music, oh, that yeah, was yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. that was crazy. Mm-hmm. The, it used to be lifting all the time, bouncing. Great. So there was a few of us on the door there. But this one night, there was a the lad and lass used to come in all the time. And they used to think he was a bit of a jack the lad. And this night, you know, the music was quiet. Like the, you know, in between the music, mm-hmm. he just went off it with him. Must have been like having a big argument. All the glasses had just been washed. They were all on the bar. The most fucking just the bar was full. He went over to the bar and he started smashing them all. They were all over the floor. I was flinging them everywhere. They was smashing. And everyone was looking. Everyone just looked at the door to me and this other lad, thinking. Are you gonna do anything about that? And it, but he was in a rage at the time. I thought I'll just finish, let him finish what he's doing. And he had to walk past us to get out. So he storming, storm past us. So I just stood in front of him like that, and he threw a punch at me. <laughs> so I just slipped it right, and a bang! I hit him with the right hand. I only hit him with the one. Bang! Right, I knocked his toe front teeth out. But I didn't realise I'd knocked them out at the time. I just hit him with such a shot. And he went down and he was going, Aah. my teeth are out, my teeth are out. I fucking hell. I looked down, clapped, there was a bit of tooth still stuck in my hand. I don't mm-hmm. know if you can see that there. I mean, can you see oh, it? Oh, yeah. And there? And I was still in there. Yeah. yeah. So oh. they took him in the toilets and cleaned him up and that, but he had no front teeth in. He'd been knocked straight out. And uh, but a couple of weeks after that, police come and lock me up over it. He obviously put wise to combo. So I said, look, okay, it was self-defence. I've got loads of witnesses. My witnesses went and gave statements to say he, he threw a punch at them and it was just self-defence, so they just kicked it out. Mm-hmm. So how many jobs did you do in it, those? Loads. Loads? Loads and loads and loads, mate. Did people ever come to you and say, right, I heard you've got a reputation, let's go out the back door and have a fight? So how was that arranged? Well, what would happen would be, pardon, people would know about your reputation and they'd come to the pub with a couple of tough guys or the back up. They'd look and oh, that's something there, there. And then they'd have a drink and then they'd start being clever working the tickets we call it working the tickets here I don't know what yours call it work your tickets go on being clever so wanting a reaction from you so you go oh well, calm it down lads calm it down you fucking talk oh, you know all that's to mm-hmm. look at me you're going hey, well, fuck get outside well uh, one night uh, this lad said to me he shouted at me because he was he was in a crowd and he was wanting to be because well, he used to be a boxer and he was thought and he'd done a bit of jail and he was out and he was like feeling feeling his feeling his feet. Right, I'll have him. I'll have Richie, he's got the reputation, I'll take him. So he shouted, Yeah, oh, you I turned on, looked at him, he said, Yeah, you outside now, me and you. I was like, turned on. Just on me, yeah, you fucking get outside, blah blah blah. <laughs> Says, right. 
And I, I thought he was wearing me up, you know, I thought, is this for real? Because he used to be a boxer, I thought. He's, he's going to get outside, he's going to say, hey, I had you there. Mm. But as, a, as I took my coat off to go outside, he shouted, I'm the best 14 stone you'll ever come across. So he shouted, I said, 14 stone? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, what weight were you then? I was about 17 stone then. Oh, where'd you? So you, so, you grew a lot so then? So he was outside waiting for me. It was a big glass, all, big glass window, so everyone mm. could see outside. So he was stood waiting for me. So I goes out. And I waited for him to come to me, and I thought, that's what I thought that was going to happen. I thought he was going to say, ah, I got you there. But as he got a bit too close, I grabbed him there. And then he was banging up, I couldn't try it. I thought, this is serious shit. Mm -hmm. this is. I pushed him away to get me, get me distance. And then I hit him, bang, with the right hand, hit him with the left hook. And then he went down. And when he went down, I knew he was finished. And I felt like, what a fucking anti-climax that mm -hmm. was. Yeah, all the shouting. Yeah. And... So I bent over him and I fucking cracked him a couple more times. Bang, bang in his jaw. And someone ran out screaming, ah, leave him and all that. But he was he was finished. Mm -hmm. So I went back inside and people said, well, I'm glad you done that. He was being out but cheeky and mouthy and being the E-man all night. Mm -hmm. So they phoned the ambulance, the ambulance come for him, and he was still laid there, hadn't moved. I thought, God, then is he going to be all right? So, well, <laughs> this is funny because my mate Mick Sorby and, and, his, uh, and his pal, they were sat in the chair, but they were, they had, they were full of E and that, and they were sat <laughs> looking out the window. <laughs> Mick said, told me this later. He says, when the ambulance pulled up, about 10 o'clock at night, so it was dark. Ambulance pulled up, he said. Ronnie, what the fuck's an ice cream van down outside this time of night? He said, hey, I don't know, Mick. I don't know. I thought it was ice cream van. <laughs> <laughs> was it uh, ecstasy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was an ambulance yeah. and then the, the cat had him off. So did you become a target then for people? Yeah. Because obviously the reputation was growing. But, yeah, he got his but he got his jaw broken four places. Steel plates and screws mm -hmm. a lot. But I didn't feel bad about it because he brought it all on himself. Of course, man. You know? Yeah, and I think people need to be learning the lesson. Just like the boy you says, who was selling the coke, and you put him in his place, yeah. and then he changed as a person. People change until they, get, they actually get yeah. a beating, their ass kicked. So, anyway, I, I used to be fighting constantly mm -hmm. on the doors. Everyone used to come for a pop. I would get out the back. And what have you, I moved to this other place which was the, uh, the in place at the time. It was mm -hmm. called Fifth Avenue and Paradise Alley. It was downstairs, upstairs. And, and I, I, I went there and my first night there, the doorman was saying, oh, yeah. He said, there's this lad who comes in every Friday. He's a bastard nuisance. He won't see his drink off. He's a proper piss take. So you have all the doorman stood round him. I would see your drink off, see your, see your drink off. So he'd pick his drink up and go like that to see his drink off. Ta-da. What? Taking the piss. I said, so has no one dragged him out? No, no. So they just stood there, like, and he was taking the piss out of them. Mm -hmm. I said, well, if he comes in tonight, I'll be nipping it in the bullet, it won't be happening again. And I think, well, all right, well. So anyway, at, at the end of the night, clearing away, getting everyone out, away, so you up, get out. And I, and I looked down, I seen the crowd of Dorman and killed some lads, and I thought, I wonder if, that, that, I wonder if that's that lad. So I goes over, I said, what's going on here? And uh, he said, oh, it's a fucking lad, he wants his drink off. I says, won't he? He says, he will now. So I stood in front of him, I said, right, you've got 10 seconds to see your drink off, I'm taking it off you. He looked at me, smirking. I says, one, two, three, four, right. Grabbed his pint out of his hand, right. Poured it over his head, put it down, while he was in, and I fucking cracked him, flattened him, right. Broke his nose and that, and, and all his mates, whoa, whoa, we, whoa, we don't want it out of, you know, all mm -hmm. that shit. So, but that was never, he never came back in the club until he got word to ask me if it was okay if, if he would come in for a pint and he would leave as mm -hmm. soon as he had it. So that nipped that in the bud, didn't like, 
Yeah. Didn't like people taking the piss like that. Yeah, I think that's the best way. You've broke your hand how many times? Ten? <sighs> ten times? Lots over and ten? lots of times. Lots and lots of times. What's that pain like, the feeling? Very, very painful. Very painful. I, I'll tell you about uh, a few times I broke them. One, one time when I, I fought this big guy, 25 stone. But the build-up to that fight was... There was a knowing people whisper Chinese whispers mm -hmm. or he said this about you and he, he'll do you and he'll and he and there was this well respected man who, who fought he was getting into his forties but he was still still a, an animal he, he mm -hmm. was like well respected everywhere and he was known as a fighting man and uh, I had a lot of respect for him and he, he looked like a and then that was that and uh, then there was, a, there was another guy who I called I called the caveman he gave me the biggest hiding of my life he was a uh, big man like 16, 17 stone but an animal he was knocking everyone out big right hand he was called Brian and all funny enough mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone was terrified of him because he could he could bat and he, he was knocking tough guys out all the time and uh, I'd been working oh, it was New Year's Eve I'd worked from 12 o'clock on the day till like 12 o'clock on the night bouncing drinking chucking people out this that and the other and I was back at a party it was a house party it was about four it was about four o'clock in the morning I was late <laughs> and that's uh, <clears throat> And there was somewhat gone on, and I gave someone a clip, and it was Brian's mate. I didn't even know I'd give him a clip because I was that drunk. And I, I remember sitting on the toilet because I was on the toilet, and I uh, was saying, "Fucking get him out of here now! I want him out of here." It was Brian screaming for me, wanting me in the garden. <clears throat> and I was thinking, oh, if I wasn't so pushed, fuck, I'd be straight in the garden with him. I think oh, I can't go out like this. I was, I was walked down halfway down the stairs and I just sat on the stair. A couple of lads were at the door. One of them uh, was my pal. He said, well, an associate of one you from school. Dean, who's like long dead now. Richie, you're not going out there, mate. I won't let you go out. He says, you're no fit state to go out there. He'll fucking kill you. <clears throat> so I'm sat there. So I was sat there for about five, ten minutes. And in that time of sitting there, I thought I'd sobered up. <laughs> I thought I got mm -hmm. So, and he was to the door and I said, fucking let me out there. So as I walked out, <laughs> as I walked, I took the first step off the step onto the grass. The lights went out. He was just stood waiting for me. Man, he took my head clean off. Bang, down, I went down like a sack of shit. And then he just got on top of me. And he just, I remember laying there. Couldn't raise my hands to stop him, you know. It was just smashing, smashing, smashing. And I was thinking, stay with it, stay with it, because I could feel myself slipping away with every punch, because mm -hmm. he was hitting me that hard. And I could feel myself slipping away. I'm thinking, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. And I thought, is he ever going to fucking get off? And he smashing the fuck out of me. I thought, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, stay with it, stay with it. And, I, and when he finally finished, he got off. I think he must have hit me about thirty times. I took, I took some, I took an absolute pasting, beating. Mm -hmm. So that was that, and then obviously I went around the town for. The How was that feeling though, from getting that? It was horrible. Yeah, but I, because I was so drunk, you don't really count it. I did, yeah, yeah, because I had such hammer. Mm -hmm. But maybe the drink had numbed a bit of the pain, pain, but. Next day, and then over the next week or so, you should have seen the state of me. Oh man, there was no nothing broke. I thought me both cheekbones were broke because they were that bad. My nose was broke and everything. I couldn't see out of my left eye because it was just all grazed. I couldn't even see a thing. So I went to the Sunderland Eye Infirmary get checked out because I thought that was maybe going blind because that was like. I thought it had been sliced or something. And uh, when I got x-rays and all that, just said, all your eyes, all grazed, it's going to take a while for 
you get your vision back. But luckily there's no no broken bones. I says, what? I says, my cheekbones are not broke. And that, my nose is not broke. No, I couldn't believe it. So anyway, I've left licking my wounds then, wasn't I? Bad, bad defeat. Took an absolute hammer. It nearly killed me. But I was still saying to myself, stay with it. And that's me. My strong mind kept me there because other people would have slipped away and died. So Brian, the caveman, I called him. Mm -hmm. he, he was the new king, wasn't he? So, and uh, it's all, you know, he and his reputation just went and crazy. Yeah. What age were you and then? I was about 27 then. And then uh, I just had to, I stayed off the doors and I, Recovered because I, I had to recover mm -hmm. properly and I had to recover mentally. Were you embarrassed? Yeah, I was embarrassed, but I had to recover mentally as well as emotionally, mm -hmm. physically, the lot. Because uh, I, I question yourself all the time. I'm not, obviously not as good as I think I was, and you know, mm -hmm. and he's the better man, and but I had to find out who was the better man so I knew. Once I was properly healed and uh, got my mind right and I was ready, I'd be going to going to fight him. And if he beat me, I would have shook his hand and said, you're the best man. So I don't know how long I took. Might have took six months. I, can't, I, just, I have no recollection of how long I took. But when I was ready, I knew I could feel in myself it's not. I'm. I'm not far away now. Before I'm right, you know, I'm right, and I want this fight. So when I was ready, I thought, right, tonight's the night. I'm. I'm going there, because he used to go to this club. He used to drink in this club. There was. I was a lot of them drinking in the club. And uh, I got Volce and a couple of other lads to watch me back. I says, and as we were going up to the club, butterflies, because this is like. Yeah, yeah, big yeah. thing for you. Yeah, yeah. it's your pride. Yeah, everything. Yeah. If you get beat, then uh, you're finished, yeah. aren't you? But I would, do, I would have shook his hand and said, "You're the better man," you know, because that's what I was like. So they waited over the other side of the road, and I walked over to the road to the club, big, uh, big window. I looked in, I seen them. He had his back to me. I thought, there he is. Fucking butterflies go. There was a load of them in there. Banged on the window, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> they all turned down. When they seen me, fucking stood up like that. I said, you. <laughs> yeah, okay. And the fuck, that was on then, it was on, yeah. so. So they all come spelling out. And then, uh, but I'd give myself a bit of distance. I'd walked over to the middle of the road, just over the, near the cab. And I was stood, I was, I was ready, I was prepared for them. And I knew he was relying on this massive right hand, because that was his. That was his. Uh, that was his. Mm. In goes bingo in it. So and he and he stood on the step of the club and he looked over. He said, "Do you want another fucking good hiding, do you?" I says, "Yeah, come on, bring it on." So all, all his mates pulled out and he come out and uh, we met in the middle of the road there. And he and I was prepared for this big right hand. Then he threw this big right hand. It was a like a money shot. I was coming, so I slipped it. But I also had that blocked, you know. So I I slipped it and took whatever whatever he, he had there, and uh, I come back with a shot, and then another shot, and then he went down. And when he went down, I got on top of him, and I smashed away. Right. Because I knew I was thinking about what he did to me. And I smashed away on him, broke broke my hands, yeah? Broke both hands on him. But I had to get off him because he was gaggling on his own blood and mm -hmm. all that. And I thought, I'm going to kill him if I don't get off. So I got off. Anyway. And that was uh, that was one all. The revenge. Yeah, that was one all. And, and, and he went to hospital and he was in a bad way. Bad way. Mm -hmm. But he survived. And then, I don't know how long after that, but as far as I was concerned, I, I beat him fair, fair and square, square yeah. 
when we were both sober. Mm-hmm. And uh, my lad forgot about it. I, said, I hope he forgets about it. Let's forget about his father. Mm-hmm. So one night it was Vulture's birthday. And we went downtown for a drink. Yeah, it's Vulture. Eh? Yeah, it's that's Vulture. Your that, be, one of your best it, friends. He was, was a good pal of mine. We used to, uh, he, was, he was on McIntyre's underwear. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah. Uh, with Brian. Mm-hmm. And uh, I used to work the doors with him. And mm-hmm. So it was his birthday and we were out having a drink. And I walked in this bar and nobody seen him, but I did. I spotted him at the bar. The caveman. Brian. <laughs> the caveman. <laughs> Oh, there's Brian. He was with his bed and another lad and lass. And I thought, I'll just ignore them, pretend I haven't seen them, go around the other side of the bar and just... Uh, it's forgot about as far as I'm concerned. But obviously, I'd been spotted. So when we'd had our drink and they'd left, I watched them go. And when we'd had our drinks and what have you, when we would go to the next pub... <clears throat> Vulture was stood talking to the doorman and uh, the other lads went out walked out first and then as I walked out the door I just <laughs> set foot on the pavement and the lights went out <laughs> the lights literally went out smash he caught me bingo big right hand and he took my head off my shoulders but I fell right back into the windows of the pub. What kept me up? And I was stood there like that. And uh, that's why I didn't go down. And he bang, bang, and he hit me another couple of times. And I was, I just, the only thing I could describe it was like, an hand grenade going off in your head. <laughs> Boom! I was like that. <laughs> White flash. And then just complete darkness. And then I just didn't have a clue what was going on. And then he hit me three times, and I was still stood there. And one of my mates jumped in and shouted, "Wow, what's going on here?" And he and the, he took a couple of steps back and shouted, "Fucking come on, I'll fight that lot here!" So he was right up for it. <laughs> he was right. Up. He must oh, have been a oh, tough oh, bastard. Oh, he was a fucking animal, mate. <clears throat> he couldn't yeah. have fight there. Yeah. And then, and as he, and he was saying that, I was like coming round and thinking. Oh, and then I, you know, focusing. I was groggy. <laughs> my lips were bust. There's all blood coming down. And I and I, I tried to walk forward, and my legs were like jelly. And and then I realised it was Brian who uh, who done this. And I thought, fucking hell, no. What can I do? And one of my mates said, right, let them fight, let them fight. And I'm thinking, let them fight. Hmm. If he catches me again, I'm finished. Because my legs are like I'm, so. The lads stopped the cars, because we was in the middle of York Road. The lads stopped the cars getting past, and we were fighting in the middle of the road. And it was coming to land big shot. He was throwing big shots, and I was, like, doing my best to just slip them and slip them. I was just fighting on memory there, you know. Mm. Right? And uh, probably muscle memory or whatever. Mm. And I was trying to get revive myself, revive myself, throwing a few shots, missing, glancing, blows landing, and then I just... Pull this big left hook out the fire, bang right, and as he, I watched his eyes roll on his head as he went down, bounced off the floor, and as uh, that left hook landed, I broke my hand and broke his jaw. So I dragged him off the road, and the cars go past, and then I got I got on top of him again. I thought you bastard. You're dead that time. <laughs> I thought yeah. you bastard. So I hit him a few more times, and that's it. Get it, you're gonna kill him. Get off. So as I got off, he looked. I thought he was gonna die because he was mm-hmm. gaggling and there was fucking blood coming out of every orifice. And luckily for me, at that very moment, the uh, ambulances was going up York Road and seeing what was going on and pulled straight over. And the paramedics worked, worked on him straight away and then got him straight to the hospital. Mm-hmm. Because if that wasn't going by then, I think he'd have died. Murder charge. I think it would have been manslaughter or something. Yeah, yeah, self-defence is possible but, as well. <clears throat> yeah. But long after that, we became friends. And, you know, we had a bit chat about the fights and hmm. 
What about, he said, I had always had people whisper in my ear, oh, you were scared of Richie, aren't you? You didn't have another fight. No, so he says, that was just playing on my mind all the time. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Well, people, Chinese yeah, whispers, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Oh, horrible. Yeah, mud stacks. That's yeah, the type of people and, saying and, shit. There was another guy who was a good fighter. And I was out this night, and you know, you're just sick of fighting, and you want a mm -hmm. peaceful night. Because we're working on doors all the time, thought, oh, I'm going to have a nice, peaceful night. <laughs> I am not going to hit anybody, yeah. even if they want it. Yeah. They want it. I'm not going. So I goes into the goes into this pub. It was crowded, packed. Pushed me way into the bar. Pushed me way to the bar. Geez, who the fuck are you pushing? Just ignored him. Said, you want fucking chill? Joe means trouble. Mm -hmm. I just ignored him. He says, you better not want fucking Joe neither if you know what's good for you. You know, like, I thought, I looked at him. and You could see he'd been a bit of a fucking mm -hmm. scrapper. But I didn't know later he, he had a good reputation, this lad. So I took my drink and I was stood on the other side and I could, he was talking to his mate and fucking him over there. But I thought, oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> Be the bigger man and walk away with it, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I couldn't. So, as they finished the drinks and were walking out, I just walked and stood to the entrance. I says, Yeah, I don't want fucking Joe. <laughs> Bang, I hit him with the right hand, man. Fucking Paul axed him. Big, I was a big cut over here or whatever. And the ambulance coming out and police, and I just done one out of the way. And he said, He said, I hit him with a glass ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> so the majority of people you beat yeah, make up lies and shit yeah, as well. Yeah, because they were tough guys and they were embarrassed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How was it then going out every night and people, many of us, try to challenge you all the time? Was it, were you up for it or were you just like, you got sick, sick, sick and tired? You got sick yeah. of it. You got sick of it. So it seemed like every loan in friggin' 20 mile radius was coming. What's the person who you fought the most? The caveman, three times? Three times, yeah. Three times, the caveman. Is he still three alive? Total fight, yeah. He's a, he's, a, he's a canny lad, actually. You know, still? As you get older and you mellow out. Yeah. And you two, you bump into people and you say, mm -hmm. hey, remember? Blah, blah, yeah, yeah. It's all water under the bridge mm -hmm. now. So you have healthy respect for people, don't you? Because yeah. them... Them people like the Dave O, Big Bry, mm -hmm. Gave Man, and they all stood on, toe to toe, bare knuckle, fighting, and that's how you sorted your trouble. Yeah, out. no knives, no like guns. Like the old school. Yeah. You know, they don't mm -hmm. like men, mm -hmm. you know. And but how's your so face? You have a lot. Your face is fresh considering the punches you've took. There's no many uh, scars. I don't, know. I don't know how. You know, I'm. Do you know what I mean? You wouldn't look. You well, wouldn't think. If you that. see my nose under a uh, under a proper <laughs> light, looks like it's been through a, <laughs> a chopping board. Because <laughs> people say, yeah. will see me under a light. And say, Bloody hell, Richie, I've seen your nose. Yeah. It's as if someone's been carving, carving. Things yeah, but your it. your eyes, your eye sockets. Your there's no like dents. I've been very lucky. Yeah, I'm really. Been very lucky. But uh, yeah. So anyway, him. Oh, I was on about him. Mm -hmm. He put, he got a price put on my head. I was guys coming to, to take. He says, "Oh, I thought it was a thousand pound or two thousand pound." Going back like a long time ago, mm -hmm. it was a few quid. So all you have all the tough guys coming for. Oh yeah, I'll have a, I'll have a bit of that. So they're all coming, coming for the fight. Oh, he's coming down. So he's wants to fight. Yeah, he wants that money. He's coming. To, mm -hmm. uh, was another lad from. Wingard supposed to be the hardest man in Wingard. He came down. So it was money getting involved yeah, in? He, yeah, well, because he put a bounty on me head, hadn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so they're all coming down. So yeah. he, he'd come down with this uh, guy from Wingard, John, big lad, scrapper, came down with a, a, a lad called Keith. I didn't know them, but I found the names later. Mm. Anyway, that Keith was a smaller one, and he was, I could see Keith shouting off. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. And all that. I thought, fucking, here we go, here we go. So I just, you know, just fucking sick. I walked straight down, hit that Keith, bang, bang, right down. He was gone, left out, he was gone. And I'd done it that quick. That John, Big John, was uh, shocked. Like, I hit Big John and Paul axed him. And anyway, they got the ambulance. Keith and John got took to the hospital. 
Keith had his jaw broke in three places. I don't know if I broke John's jaw, but John had spoke to Mick Sorby, my pal, and said when he hit me, it was like getting hit by armor. Mm-hmm. And then Big John calmed down then, because I'd through the collieries and all that, he was a big tough guy, and they'd been flat and low on bad. Mm-hmm. So, uh, been calmed down, and then years and years later, I met that big John. All right, but she was a bit cheap. Yeah, all right, he had like he had a shop, or stalls, uh-huh. and that. And then uh, I'd spoken to him a few times. Yeah, all right, and, but he never mentioned that. But he uh-huh. just was a bit yeah, cheapish yeah. about it. Did you ever come across any of the gypsies? But I, but I spoke to a lad who knew him well. Mm-hmm. And he says, "When you flattened out, flattened him." Took some of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think you changed a lot of people. Out of them. Did you ever come across any of the gypsies? Well, I, I knew quite a few of them, but never, never really yeah, had to local to. fights with them. Mm-hmm. Well, I had a few boxing fights with them. What age did you start getting like calming down a bit and getting tired of it all? I, well, I'm trying to. Well, I'm with you. I'll tell you when I, I packed it all in. Mm-hmm. Was. Uh, I was going, that was, my mum died in front of me. Sorry to hear that. My mum died, she had a heart attack in front of me. Just me and her. She was, I was, she was talking to me, and I was, I was looking in the drawer. And I said something, she never said no. I said something again, she never said no. So I turned around, she had a heart attack. Fuck, I was shocked, so I was shouting. I thought, I've heard that. The last thing you hear is the voice. Mm-hmm. So... I was shouting, "Mom!" you know, dead loud, and right, yeah. as if it, if it would, like, she'd, you know, wake up type of thing. Mm-hmm. But she didn't. And I think, oh, I was shocked, you know, I didn't know what to do. So I picked the phone up, for 999, and they said, well, what, what service? I says, can I have a taxi? First thing come to my mouth, can I have a taxi? She says, you've got, you've got the wrong uh, service. I said, oh, I mean, I mean mm-hmm. ambulance. Anyway, so that was like a, just a big mad shock. Mm-hmm. So I was I started drinking all the time then, <clears throat> and acting daft, yeah. going That's, down the town, yeah. you know, like seeing people who we had had a previous grievance with, or who'd said bad things behind your back about you. And, and because of the dark place I was in with my mum. A funeral, and it was only I had to sort everything out. It was only me, and mm-hmm. and I was suffering this grave. I was grieving. I was suffering a lot, so I was drinking. And I was, I was and that's how I reacted. I would, uh, I busted there, so I fucking flatten him and I'd feel like I'd get, and that. And I, next angry. day I'd feel like shit. Yeah. Thinking, oh, fucking, what to do that for? Mm-hmm. And then th- this last night, the very last night, uh, when I said that, enough's enough. There was a boxer. I didn't really know him, but he was a boxer, ex-boxer, no good boxer. And he and he came and and I was out, out with an ex-boxer friend of mine called Philly Bailey, who's dead now. Well, Philly, me and him, Philly used to have some brain damage and was in the gym in the early eighties. And he was a, he was tough. He was the main man, the most men they used to call though, because Philly got into the football hooligan. Element and, and he was like the main man for Hartlepool, Philly. Go around all fighting the main men of all, all other places. Mm-hmm. So me and him were having a drink. And we're down, we're in this bar. And then this, we're just having a drink, man, our own business, having a chat. And I'm, I'm obviously still in this dark place because of my mum. And, and, but knowing that I, I need to come out the other side, I need to come out of it. Because... Either I'm going to get killed or someone else is going to get killed. Mm-hmm. And uh, this boxer comes over, ba 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 ba, And I thought, oh, so he's saying stuff like that for us. I says, get yourself away, mate. Get yourself away before you get hurt. So he went and then he was stood over with, with his couple of mates. And I seen them looking over. I thought, he's come over here. He's probably saying, I've just offered Richie out. He doesn't want it, blah, blah. I'm going to get him out. So he, he come back over. Giving it the big one, I says, look, I'm it. I says, I've told you to go. I says, I want you to go now. I'm going to knock you out. And he wouldn't. So I knocked him out, right? But I hit him with the right hand, such, I was square in the jaw. And he was like, on the floor, groaning, uh, you know, like in a spasm. And I thought, 
I said, Philly, I'm going. And the, so I decided that was it that night. That was my finish. Mm -hmm. So never again, because I'm going to end up in jail or I'm going to, someone's going to end up killing me or I'm going to. How old were you? I was 40. So that was the age when and you that started? That was the end, yeah. Still but young. I, I, had been, I, I had been shot, well, not shot. There was a few dodgy things happened when when I was a bit younger, when I was, I was the fighting going on and people have grievances and I was in a, I was in a after party one night, well, after, after drinks in the, in this barn and the armed response team burst in over the guns and that. The dad, we didn't know what was going on, he says, Richie Ostley in here. Says, yeah, here I am. Why? Says, we just wanted to check if you were here. And that, I didn't. They didn't really say much. But what had happened was someone was lying and wait for me to come out of the club to shoot me. And obviously, somebody who knew what was going on had a conscience and phoned and mm -hmm. phoned up, and then the police went and he, he was there with a gun. Yeah. So you could potentially have been murdered. Yeah. Was that a revenge for the past, your past attacks? Well, it could have been a revenge for all sorts. Mm -hmm. and I, honestly, when I beat this fucking about six foot five drug dealer at once, oh, I had a grievance with over something stupid, but it could have been bad. Yeah. I followed him in the car and he pulled over, pulled up at some shops. You know, I was following him. He pulled him up, pulled up at some shops. And uh, obviously, loads of people there thought I wouldn't do now. So he gets out the car. I was with Mick, and he says, me and Mick, what's going on here? I says, you know what's going on. So I said about him, bang, bang, bang. I think I broke his ribs, broke his nose. And, and then he, he ran over the road, and he shouted, Richie, I'm going to have you shot. Mm -hmm. I says, oh, yeah, right, or whatever. I've heard it all before. So I took no notes of it. And just one of my old friends who was like a serious gangster if you want to call him gangster or a pirate or whatever you want to call him he was uh, I had a word with him I says uh, I told him what had happened with him and, and I threatened to uh, have me shot and he said Richie he said you know what he says that man he says I've known that man for years he says that that's the first time I've, and I've had, ever heard anything like that happen to him he said he's going to be embarrassed he's going to want revenge he says take it seriously I says really he says take it seriously mate he says, get in quiet. So I seen someone else, and they put the feelers out. And, yeah, <laughs> the, there was a hitman coming down the shoulders, and it got stopped. Mm -hmm. It got stopped. But stupid little things like that. Yeah, uh, but it's scary, isn't it? Yeah, when you think, think about it, yeah. To think about that. So how did the story about um, you come to <clears throat> fight Charlie Bronson when he was coming out the jail? Well, um I got offered the fight because Charlie, me and Charlie, we, we became a pen, pen pal here and that. And, and we're really good friendly terms anyway. My sister committed suicide because you know when the two girls in the pram when I was a baby, one of the, I met them when I was 19. And we were pals, we were my sisters. Mm -hmm. and then one of them committed suicide and when Charlie found out he sent us a lovely letter and all that and about it and talking about suicide and all this that and the other uh, and so we come like close with letters and that and then I get a letter one day off him Richie I'm getting my artwork uh, displayed in Leeds there's going to be a, this that and the other and all it's all going to be for Zoe's Hospice or something he says and you're my guest of honour so you've got to be yeah, and uh, you've got to phone this bloke up, the organiser, and blah, blah, and all that. And I thought, oh, well, nice to be asked, really. But I was busy at the time, you know, I was working and I was doing that. And I thought, I don't know if I'm going to make that. Anyway, I forgot about it. Then I get another letter Richie, uh, you haven't phoned so and so yet. You've got to be, get in touch with them, buy so blah, 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 and all that. And obviously, him being been incarcerated, well, it was a my big thing to him, you know what I mean? But to me, I just said, oh, fucking can't be bothered. I'm born here, I'm doing it. So I just forgot about it. I forgot about it, right? 
a few weeks later, however, gets a letter off of Charlie <laughs> Fuming. Is that your fucking game? Disrespecting people, blah, 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 and then put the guilt trip on me. Mm. It's about so, so, it's this, it's that, yeah, fucking blah, blah, blah. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, oh, you're talking, oh, yo. So I wrote my letter back, I said, oh, the fuck do you think you're talking, oh, yo? I'm not at your beck and call. It was nice to be asked, but, you know, I'll do my own thing, I'm my own man. And who the fuck do you think you are? I says, you've never over fought. Nobody. Mm. Bums. <laughs> I told him, I'll put it on. I says, mm. you will be fought, bums. You never fought anyone who could fight. You never fought anyone with the, the calibre of I've fought. I've fought at much higher level than what you fought. You've just knocked idiots out. I says, uh, you wouldn't last around with me, mate. So just, you know, button it type of thing. And I fucking, I knew what I did. He's top of the bin. I thought he'd, he'd been doing his press ups. Mm. I'll fucking kill him, I'll kill him. I get my parole, I'll kill him. So anyway, I was waiting for a letter back, but I didn't get one off him. I got I contacted off one of his really close pals. I was dead now. And uh, he told me to phone him, so I phoned him. We had a big chat. And uh, I says, yeah, I'll fight Charlie. He says, uh, Ch- he said Charlie's going to get parole. It's definitely, it's on for parole. And it's going to, so, and he wants to fight you. I says, yeah, I'll fight him. He says, uh, but it's going to be 70-30 split. He said, because he's the big name. The media, the TV, the papers, they'll go crazy for him. A man who's been in case, incarcerated for all that time to come out to fight, unlike all that. So those big names involved, wanting to be involved, like, I should say, Roy Shaw, Joe Pyle, and I want to be involved with you know, run about the big marquee tent in London and all that, you know, all the big. Mm-hmm. It's going to be massive. And I thought, well, 70 30, I thought it'll be a few quid. I'll earn a nice few quid out of this. And anyway, cut a long story short, he got knocked back on his parole. I was fucking gutted. I was gutted, me like. Mm-hmm. So I never spoke for years and years after that, and then got in touch. And we were just, we were just, uh, whatever will be, will be, no hard feelings. And yeah. friends again after that. And I heard he's going to be, he's up for parole yeah, again soon. And, yeah. I, and I I think he deserves it. Yeah, he he's, does. He's, had, he's been in that. Yeah, I've had he a lot of people on the show man. who's close with Charlie as well. And they, they actually say he's a nice man. They say he's actually yeah, a nice he's character. Great, and, yeah. f- oh, great man. The stuff he put in them letters to mm-hmm. me, sentimental stuff. Like uh, about my mum dying, mm. about my sister killing herself, and, and all really not spoken by a madman, sp- spoken yeah. by someone with feelings or mm-hmm. who, who, who's you know who's seen a bit of life. Yeah. What about who, um, who, you know the tax man, Big Brian Cockrell, who I'm good friends with. I love Brian. Oh, He's a great Brian, guy. Yeah, well, me and Brian have been friends for well, 1994. We became friends, but we didn't start out as as best of pals because you know with all the Chinese whispers yeah people whispering in my ear oh I've heard Brian Cockrell wants to fight you says does he says yeah there's a rumour going around Brian Cockrell wants to fight you says does he well tell Brian Cockrell I'll fucking fight him (laughs) 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 so and and I think people were whispering in Brian's ear Mm -hmm. saying yeah did you ask he wants to fight you and he says, she also wants to fight me. Tell us, she also I'll fucking fight me, wants to fight me. So it was like that, and now people were trying to bring us together for a fight. Mm-hmm. You know, like they did with Dave and uh, yeah. the Br- Chinese whispers, whether it was true or not, or whether just people were trying to move you like pawns, you know? Yeah, playing the game. Yeah. Did you enjoy that, though, so, as well? But no, nah, the fuck. No? Nah. So then it's just to fight people? Yeah, just... Fighting because what were you getting out of at the yeah. end? Yeah, yeah, people are bad. But uh, there was a a crime family. Well, well, I I got sick of hearing the, and I saw so I phoned for someone up and I says, "I've heard Brian Cockman wants to fight me. Tell him I'll fucking fight him if he wants to fight me." I said, "All right, I'll, I'll tell him. Yeah, there's rumours going all over." So anyway, there was a, a crime family got involved and. Wanted, oh, we're friends with Brian. 
were friends with me. But there was a little bit iffy with us because we, we needed to break the ice again. So we had to meet them in a pub somewhere. So me and my pal Vic, we went to meet them. And Brian wasn't there. I says, where's Brian? He said, oh, he hasn't come, we've come. And we sorted it all out then. He, he said, we, we don't want you and Brian fighting because someone's going to get killed, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he had a fucking big magnum took in his <laughs> waist. <laughs> Fuck like Dirty Harry. <laughs> but, uh, honest and uh, anyway, so I said, uh, I'll have to arrange a meeting with you and Brian. I'll, uh, I says, right, yeah, nice one. So now we met, went out of town, met Brian. Fuck right. But from that day, we were great friends, yeah. really good friends. Yeah. And he's, he, you just get an uh, impression of somebody mm-hmm. without meeting them. They'd say all these bad things and this about them. You, get, you have an impression of someone before you even meet them. Like people used to say bad things about me. So Richie Horsley, the name would say, oh, Richie Horsley, oh, he's horrible. Yeah. Name. Have you sat down and had a cup of tea with Richie mm-hmm. Arsley and spoke to him? Yeah. No? Well, why make judgments yeah. then? I was the same with Brian. When I met Brian, I thought, just a big fog. But then when you actually listen to him, he's, he's bang on, man. He's very intelligent, very smart. Great when big got, guy. When he got his two and a half, yeah, mm-hmm. two, yeah for uh, driving offences. Yeah. He, he went right down to about 18 or 19 stone, right? I went to visit him <laughs> in mm-hmm. prison, right? And uh, being one of these family there we went to Joseph's so we went to visit him and when he co- come in on the visit the hell he, 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 cause he was fucking huge and, he, and he'd lost about three or four strokes <laughs> 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 cause he wasn't pumping any hormones yeah, or yeah. juice into him mm-hmm. and uh, but he looked so he said I said fucking hell it just looked looked like but it, it was like 15, 18 18 19 stone but he just he looked small compared to what he was but he was Still he was big. a gym yeah. he was still massive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, one day he phoned me up, he says, uh, Richie, any chance of doing us a favour? He says, well, he says, a friend of mine's just had a parrot nicked. <laughs> <laughs> I said, he says, the family are heartbroken. <laughs> I said, parrot? I said, what do you want me to do there? Like, he says, oh, can you make inquiries, man? It's over your way. Fucking hardly pulled blah, blah. I says, right. Anyway, in the paper, he was the family heartbroken over the parrot. Someone had beggled the house. And some some baghead had beggled the house, shot the parrot and sold it on. So anyway, found out who done it. Found out where the parrot was. <laughs> Went to the geezer. The, I think the geezer paid a few quid for this parrot mm-hmm. off this beggler. Mm-hmm. I said, well, tough, tough shit, mate. You've lost the parrot now. You know, because the, the block didn't know it was stolen. Yeah. So well, I said, well, you've lost it because that parrot belongs to this family. I said, there's the parrot in the paper there. I want that parrot. That's going back to the family. He says, really? Uh, re-? He says, oh, can I come? He says, can I come to to the house with you? I says, yeah. So <laughs> the keys are the water. Came to the He must have thought, I was going to take the parrot and sell it, sell yeah, it on yeah, to someone yeah, else. Yeah. So anyway, he come with us. Took back the family. He said, "He's the parrot." Oh, they were off the moon buzzing. So they got the parrot back. Put the I can't I don't know the parrot, parrot's name, but <laughs> <laughs> Long John Silver. <laughs> so. Anyway, in the I said, the, she says the mail will want to know you know the paper. We'll want to know about the success story and and how did I get the parrot back? I said, "Well, keep my name out of it. I don't." No publicity. So mm. anyway, the it was in the mail re night with the parrot and holler. Mm. <laughs> Cockroach phone I said, Oh, thanks for that, big favour. And, and uh, people <laughs> people take the face and well, Richie Arsley, pet detective. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Taylor. <laughs> Richie Arsley, pet detective. So off and, and then another time, Brian. Mm. <laughs> Cocker. Will you uh, oh, will you do us a favour? There's gonna be a bare knuckle fight, me pal, blah blah blah. Well, will you come through? So a few of us went through for this bare knuckle fight. And uh, and when we get there, we all get out the van. 
I think Brian's told the story, hasn't he? And uh, we all get up the van, and as we're walking over, they all come spilling out. It was supposed to be a one to one fight. Then all you use, pow, pow, pow. The van windows are going out. They're all shouting at us. <laughs> Honest, so I mean, one of them could have just hit you in the yeah, head, yeah. Done. Mm-hmm. So we low scarp, I don't jump, <laughs> jump back in the van. All the van, all the windows shot out, mm-hmm. drove away. One, one of the lads that was with us got shot twice. Dropped him off at the hospital and drove on. Mm-hmm. Says you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sort that out yourself, man. Well, shit like that. Yeah, yeah. You just get sick to death of living Do that life. You kind of yourself lucky to still be yeah. here. Yeah. So through all your madness, everything that you've done, and because we've spoke a good few times now, you're very well respected on the streets, especially of the fighting, and still very well respected. You've written books, but the spiritual side of things, you're very spiritual. You're very connected, which is funny to see not funny but it's for I'm a man with your calibre to be into Reiki spirituality all that stuff how did that come about? It's always been inside me it's always been in me you know yeah so I always knew what I wanted to delve into that even from being a kid when I used to sit opposite Roby and she used to say stuff to me and pierce her eyes mm. used to frighten the life out of me but I was doing a bit of security and uh this lad was telling me about a book he'd been reading about this medium and uh, uh, just somewhat just struck a card with me inside and I think wow I'd like to read that book he told us the name of the book and I went to the library got that blah 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 yeah was called Voices in My Ear by uh, Doris Stokes and I read it and I thought, wow, I couldn't put it down. I thought, this is fantastic, this. If this is true, this is fantastic. And then uh, I got another book, read that. So when I took back to the library, I said, is there any mediums in Hartlepool? Spiritualists, sorry. She says, mm. she says, I've got the name of a medium. I said, uh, let's have a look, blah, blah, blah. Oh, there, Ruby. Same name, Ruby. But Ruby Webster, she was called. She lived right over on Old Hartlepool. She said, there's a phone number there, if you want to give her a ring. So I phoned her up. And uh, she says, oh, yeah, well, we have a little... Uh, she had a, like, a little sanctuary over her house. She did healing on a Tuesday night. People went for healing on a Tuesday And on a Thursday night was like philosophy. She was like... So I used to, I went over and I'd used to sit there and think, oh, Wow, this is fantastic, this. She didn't give no messages, but she was talking all things. And I was thinking, my God. She said to me, if you've come here for messages, you've come to the wrong place. So she says, I don't give messages. But I noticed she had given a couple of messages. And I thought, I wonder if I get a message. I'd love to get a message off me dad, if this is all true. So I had this photograph of me dad. And I said, Dad, I was talking to him every day, five minutes every day, just in my mind, nobody else knew. Like, Dad, I've been going to this place. Yeah, spiritualists, blah, blah, blah. If, uh, and I know if it's all true, is there any, any, any chance you could come through, give me a message, just to let me know that we do survive so-called death and all that. And I was just talking, I was had a little five minutes every day with this. I'm not going this week, Dad, because I'm, I'm just going to talk every day to you and just like to build up this, mm-hmm. to let you know wherever you are that you can hear me. And I'm, so anyway, this Thursday was coming around where she, when I was going, I was saying, I'm going on Thursday night and if you don't come through, I know it's all a load of shit because... <laughs> If if it's possible you to come through, you I know for a fact you would come through. If you can hear me, I knew you I know you'd come through. So if you don't come through then I know it's bullshit and, and then I can do other things and, and not waste my time doing this, coming over here. It's a lot of lot of crap. So anyway it goes this Thursday night. And I was sat I just sat there, I was thinking, oh, I wonder if my dad comes through. So anyway, she she done all the, the nice nice spiritual 
philosophy and all that and then finishing just finished up wrapping up doing everyone's about just about to leave and that I'm thinking bastard <laughs> I was thinking I like it here I like it here but I'm not coming no more because obviously a lot of shit and uh, <laughs> and I seen Ruby right she she went oh and held on to summit because she thought she was going to fall over her and she steadied herself my uh He's pricked up and looking. And she said, I've got a man here. I've got a man here. She was looking. She said, Someone in here knows him. It's a message for someone in here. I've got a man here. Tom. Tom. That was my dad. I'm sat there like, I'm like, the fuck was, it's hard to describe the feeling, but it was like a eureka moment, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I couldn't open my mouth. I couldn't say, it's for me, it's my dad. I, I couldn't say, I couldn't. I was just... <laughs> <laughs> so you went there for your right. message, you were getting I got money. It. <laughs> I got it, he came through. <laughs> yeah. And, and But she blew me away by the things she said, because she said, this man, <clears throat> right, right, okay, calm down, calm She said, he's trying to get his message. She said, he wants to get a message to his son. She said, now this man... Oh, he's getting a message too. There's got a no, whoever he's, he's, he's got a photograph of this man here. They've got a photograph of him, and they've been talking to him with the mind. What's exactly what I was doing? I nearly collapsed. Then, you know what I mean? Mm. I'm thinking, oh my God! So I just, well, she said, well, no one can take it, Tom. No one can take it, but. And she said, well, let's give a bit more evidence, this man, we had yeah. jobs in this. Mm -hmm. I was just blown away by it. And like, for the full week after, I was like walking on air thinking, wow. Yeah. It's true. Connected to other it things. It is true. Mm -hmm. You know. So I wrote there a letter and said, that was my dad. I just couldn't open my mouth. Because I was like, rooted to the spot mm -hmm. in shock. And like in a realization, mm -hmm. wow, he's uh, answered, yeah. answered. But you'll be protected so as well. From yeah. then, <clears throat> so from then, I've always known. So I've always like, <clears throat> yeah, you know, like investigated and sat in circles and mm. learned how to meditate, learned how to breathe. So that's mm. helped help me a lot throughout the years. Why I've never been, I was going to say, never been violent. It's always been yeah. controlled aggression mm -hmm. with the fights. Never went, never lost my rag because it's always controlled, you know. Yeah. It's always, you know, when mm. you're fighting, it's always controlled. So, and I've always had it in a piece, always had it in a piece since I've learned to meditate. Yeah, calm you know, the mind. And, yeah, just, you know, so I've always had it in a piece and I've always had a. Yeah, try to know. channel everything. So, when I'm in a. Way. So, if I was in a gang of people in the room, no one knew me. And. Just the name that oh, was it, Yosley? Oh, him there. Him? That's what Yosley. Oh, the quiet one there. Because I'd be the quiet one who wouldn't say no. Because yeah. that's always mm -hmm. me. And the others are louds and boisterous mm -hmm. and And I'd just be, for all though, I'd feel a part of them. Mm -hmm. I'd feel separate as well. Yeah. I'd feel like I was on my own type of thing as mm -hmm. well. It's a lonely journey, the spiritual journey. Very it is, lonely. Yeah. But again, it's the quiet ones that are always the ones for watching. The loudest men, I always say, is the weakest. Yeah. I believe they're always the ones that's hiding. So going through your spiritual journey, Richie, and then to be an author as well, which we'll name the books here, which people can get on Amazon. You've got 10 books here. You've got On the Chin. What one's that about? Well, that was when I was uh, I was in hospital with a hernia and I was mm -hmm. just jotting a few things down about my life because... I was in a book called Street Fighters, yeah. Julian Davies, and uh, I was on the front cover of that as well. And Julian says, my God, Richie, you've got some brilliant stories. Write your own book. And I was thinking, nah, I'm not bothered about that, mate. Not bothered about that. So when I was in hospital and I had to rest up with this hernia, mm -hmm. I thought I'd just jot a few things down. So I jotted some bits and bobs down. And I got a few copies of that printed called On the Chin. So... And everyone who read it said, oh, brilliant, that, brilliant. Yeah. You should get it published anyway. Did you ever write beforehand, before all, before you started? The only time I'd ever wrote was writing to friends mm -hmm. and 
in prison. And these are all, because you've wrote books from 2017, 18, 18, 18, 19, 19, 19, 20. So that's one, two, three, four, five, seven books the last three years. You've got Born to Fight, which is in 2005. Battling Bows, what is that? Battling Bows. Uh, Battling the books over there. Yeah. It's uh, it, Geordie Bows. Mm -hmm. George Bows. He was a great fighter. Uh, in the fifties and sixties, and he, and he was the coach of the Feenies and all them. You know, when I went to the pro gym, yeah. he was their coach. Mm -hmm. So I I always thought, well, he used to listen to his stories, and he was think, bah, I bet he, I bet he's got some great uh, stories. So I went to see him to do his book, mm -hmm. and he says, yeah, great, great, Richie. So I had a I had a list of uh, <laughs> questions I was going to ask him. So I went over. All these questions, tape recorder, right, blah, 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 blah. Went for his reaction. And can't remember. Didn't know he had dementia. Shit. His wife said, he's got stable dementia, but we haven't told him yet. I thought, fucking hell. She says, but I didn't want to tell him just in case it affected him anymore. I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> so she says, what I have got, she says, I've got a big thing here, scrapbook. So that come in really handy. And then I was going down the library looking at the old fight films and, and I knocked the book up and uh, like as a tribute to George mm -hmm. Batland Bowes. He died, he, he died not long after, but... And then you've got no, nice Northern book. Warrior. And Northern Warrior, that that's a bit of the bond to fight mm -hmm. and the, on the chin... A lot of stories took out and a lot of sto different stories added, but and that was that one and I wrote that myself. Yeah, this is Northern Warrior here. So all these books are on Amazon, but we'll go through every one of them. You've got 30 Years a Fighter. That was Kevin Bennett, Kevin the Bulldog Bennett. Well, when he, he came to Hartlepool, he was a combined services mm -hmm. champion four years in a row. Yeah. And the, when I went to the boys' welfare to do a bit of co boxing coaching, and him, Billy Bessie came up from right down the road, Portsmouth, and uh, to do just a full a full season up here. Yeah. And Kevin stayed ever since, but Billy went back. But there went there was, we had them all in the ABA national ABA mm -hmm. finals, three of them in that year, and then the ten professional. And I got my pro licence as well, and I used to do a bit of corner work, corner work with Neil Fannin and that. And it was just, we, we just went on a great uh, journey. Yeah. And then, like, y years later, I, when I was doing Penny's book, remember Jim, James Quinn? No. You, have you seen the film Knuckle? Mm, the book think, Knuckle? I don't think the so. The gypsy bear knuckle fight, the James Quinn. I probably would have seen it, but... I... Well, he contacted me and says... I've got a bare knuckle show, uh, Nottingham. Uh, I'd like you to be a judge, do fancy coming down? So anyway, I went down, and I was a judge at that at that bare knuckle show. And then there was bare knuckle shows all over, Newcastle, here, there, and everywhere. And I was getting asked, well, any chance of being a judge? I thought, oh, yeah, I'll go and what, be a judge. What's a, what's a free bit of, mm -hmm. bit of knuckle? So I, I was judging at these shows, just watching bare knuckle fights. I said to my mate, Benny, he was uh, four times national uh, combined service champion and, and he was Commonwealth lightweight champion as a pro professional. He'd been retired for a bit. I says, I went to these shows. Mm -hmm. So well, Wendy used to come with me. Wendy enjoyed doing the bare knuckle yeah. shows. See, and, you're and, watching and the bare knuckle shows. Do you, do you, get, do you want you, to be you, in that? Do you, you want you, to be you there? You do, but you know you're... you're Long past your sell by date, so yeah. if you got in there, you'd get a good eye. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, What, what do you find? Do you think, Benny? So, he says, Oh, yeah, beat any of them, mate. So, I went to another one. I said, Do you fancy it? He says, Ah, oh, you do. I says, We'll take one fight at a time because you might just break your hand straight away and then be over. So, we went on a bare knuckle journey together, and I was, I was his trainer, and he was the fighter. Mm. And we, uh, well, he, he won the world title. That'd be a good film, that. He won the world so title. Would, that sounds like a good film. Yeah. So it would. He won the world title. Then he he, he made two defences. And the second defence, 
he fought Conor McGregor's mate. Uh, it was a call it cage fight out. He was like that tough as mm-hmm. Liam James. He was called. It was tough as all But we got comfort. Benny would destroy yeah. him. So, but as soon as the bell come, I know. Do you want to get on with no, that? No, no, take your time. As soon, no. soon as the bell came, the first round, he jumped on Benny. He was f- threw Benny. He grabbed Benny on the head. He punched him in the the forehead, and, and it was like, where? What's going? It was like, it was no rules. He mm-hmm. thought he was still in the in the, yeah. in the UFC. Well, so, and then seconds later, Benny had a big, massive cut again. And the fight was stopped, but you know, big buzz, one eyed buzz. Yeah, no big buzz. Well, he was the referee. Mm-hmm. So he stopped it, stopped the fight to get the doctor in to look at Benny. So the doctor brought Benny over to me. He says, I can't let him continue. I says, Give him to the end of the round. He says, I can't let him continue. He cleaned it out. He says, Look, see the skull and it, the, it was a round all like that you think you'd been it with a pickaxe a sharp object mm-hmm. not a fucking knuckle so so there was hell on over that mm-hmm. because Liam had the, they brought this rule out where you had to wear these special bandages signed off by them you couldn't wear any other bandages so but when Liam had his bandages signed off, he took them off and put a different pair of bandages on. Bandages, what you weren't allowed to use. Mm. So there was hell on over that saying, this, we were saying. Is that not cheating? Yeah, it was cheating. Mm-hmm. But the organisers didn't want to see it like that. Though I think they were a bit embarrassed because they didn't want to change. They knew they had the facts in front of them, but they didn't want to change it Liam's won and that's it mm-hmm. you know like at a lumber type of yeah. thing so there was hell on over that yeah. should have either been well couldn't have disqualified we could have disqualified him technically mm-hmm. we could have just called it a, uh, a no decision yeah no decision and rematch and a rematch yeah. but they wouldn't so they give yeah. Liam the fact so the, then we had the rematch mm-hmm. and Benny uh, stopped him in two rounds and regained the title and then Week later, he retired. But Benny was nearly forty-two year old. Then so when retired he, world champion. When he retired, yeah. So then yeah. I said, because he he start he had his first fight at eleven, and his last fight at forty-one, nearly forty-two. So that was thirty, 30 years. years. So I scored a thirty years of fight, and that's, that's all. A good title. That's his journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great journey. Yeah. So the Cinderella medium. That's about Irene Wilson. Yeah. Who lives in the Corries. Cinderella medium was because. She lived a life like a Cinderella. She was the oldest of 13 kids, or, 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 or like a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. And she was the oldest, but she was more like housekeeper, nanny, Mother. and all that yeah. for all the rest of them. So, you know, when other people were going out and enjoying themselves, she mm-hmm. couldn't. She had chores to do. She had to get the kids ready for school. She had to make the tea. She had to do. She had to, do, yeah. you know, she had to, the houses to wash. It was like Cinderella. You know, so yeah. that's why I call it the Cinderella there's some medium. jump from a cage fighting story to the Cinderella story. Yeah, b- be- because um, I was comfortable. I'd been in both yeah. worlds, hadn't I? Mm-hmm. I'd been in the fighting world and the spiritual world yeah. for a long time. Yeah, but that's good. That's amazing. Um, on the chin? Well, on the chin was that first book I scribbled down. And when I was writing for, when I was with Warcry, mm-hmm. Warcry who done the other books said I've, I've got that on the chin I said Whoa. he said uh, there's a copy of it on uh, Amazon I think it was 95 quid or something you know someone had had one from years ago stuck it on he says I'm going to buy it so do what you want mate mm-hmm. so he bought it and then he, he transferred it all into a, like as a download yeah. and called it on the chin revisited going back to the mm-hmm. but because well, the stories are in there that's not in there and you know, so he put that yeah a higher frequency higher frequency is the Cinderella medium part two okay follow up yeah the follow up and there's mm-hmm. just loads of oh, the, the yeah. mind blown stuff energies like frequencies yeah yeah I love that kind of stuff I'm going to get that by the way um, Angel with Dirty Hands I like that name Angel with Dirty Hands is a true story about a pal of mine I knew him all the way through school good lad you know, if anyone 
mentioned his name when they were just known for, oh, stay away from him. He's a druggie, he's an alcoholic. He's a, as soon as he's had a drink, he causes trouble. He was like that. But uh, I knew him when he hadn't had a drink. And, I knew, and he was a really nice lad. So he'd, he'd had all his life, he was addicted, drugs, drink, armed robbery, he uh, was in the nutty ward, in and out of prison, and all that, afflictions, couldn't get away from it, and uh, drop on acid, everything he used to do on a daily basis, but like high quantities of it, yeah. and, and then he ended up getting sectioned off and whatever, and then he, he sorted himself out, but when I met up with him years later, I used to sit and talk to him, and we'd talk and talk and talk, and talk about spirits and things to him. And he done his reiki. Mm -hmm. He done his reiki with me. And I don't know. He done his reiki tick. And that. And he learned how to meditate. And then and all, and I, it give him a whole perspective. And and he wanted to get off the drugs and the drink and all that. And then he got a phone call from his ex-wife that she had terminal cancer. Shit. So. He just dropped everything and says, right, I've got to be down there. So it was down low, he went down low, where yeah. the team was. Looked after her through her terminal cancer, and while he was there, they were arguing all the time, because obviously they didn't get on when they were yeah, together. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the kids, I'd like the stranger in there, I was telling them what to do, so mm. he got his got a little place around the corner, but he still wanted to be there looking after yeah, her. So, and then he started there. Uh, Started volunteering at the drug and alcohol centre. Mm. But because he because he was he'd been and done it and he'd mm -hmm. been through it all and was yeah. he's very, very good at his job. Yeah. So he'd done that twelve week programme, got clean. And he was a different man. Totally different man now. And because he was so good at his job, he, he got a full time job, then he got a manager's job, and then there was a big position coming with Everyone, all managers from all over London, and and out going for this job, and he got the job ahead of all them. Yeah. So he was in here, and he's actually sat in the Westminster, in a on a table, discussing the future, the way forward with drugs. Mm -hmm. how, how, that's amazing, man. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's Ronnie, and I called it Angel with Dirty Hands mm -hmm. because he's an angel now. What yeah, he he yeah, just yeah. does nothing but good, good, mm -hmm. good for people yeah, and he has a dead yeah. hands because of his past yeah. and I think but, that's the, yeah. but he didn't want I've called it Andy Glenn he didn't want his real name so I says yeah. we'll call it someone we'll call you Andy Glenn he mm. said that's alright and I think that's the beauty of life that when you hit dark places that's where I believe you find your growth that's where I believe you find your calling when you go to dark dark places yeah, that you do. when you start digging out the light this is when you start realising life can be better yeah. And when you start making it better, you don't want to go back to that darkness no, because the pain's bad. He's ten years clean and yeah, sober. That's amazing, now. man. And he's a he's a new man. Yeah, he? I love it. So he's, it's and uh, I was going to say there. Yeah, he's a new man. I was going to say something there. Oh, but I did a pre probation work before. Uh -huh. I thought I'm going to. I went to volunteer at the probation service. I thought I'm going to help put these on the right path and mm -hmm. tell them the wrong way. Well, yeah. so. So anyway, I got accepted as a volunteer mentor with the probation service. Mm -hmm. So every time I'd go into the probation, it'd, it'd be like the waiting room where all the went, and everyone sat there. All right, Richie. Hey, up, Richie. How you doing, Richie? All right. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I didn't even I'd, nine times out of ten, I didn't know them, but they all knew me. And the probation officer says, "You don't know him." No, I'm not a clue. You ever been in trouble, Richie? Nah, you know, mm -hmm. No, but that's what I'm saying is you get someone in the probation like that, for instance, you get these young scallywags. They're not going to respect a, a person who's never done out with their life. They've just read books, books yeah. and never experienced mm -hmm. it, where they'd listen to someone who's been there and like done that, it yeah. and reformed mm -hmm. and want to... Yeah, tell them the right way and the wrong way, and yeah. tell them, you know, to, to respect that person much more. Yeah, I think so. Also, 
the last book here is more than just a was it colliery girl more than just a colliery girl what one's that's that about that's Fred Robson another medium all these mediums mm-hmm. keep uh, <laughs> coming to write the books for some reason <laughs> and uh, yeah but Fred has been uh, a medium since he was a kid yeah and uh, pardon me and why I called it that was because when she met her, her husband many years ago and her, and her husband took her to meet his mum his mum was stuck up and and she said oh, I would say say Dave oh, our Dave's other girlfriend our, our Dave's other girlfriend was much prettier than you <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean things yeah, like that yeah, yeah, and she yeah, said yeah. and she was a nurse mm-hmm. you're just a colliery girl mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so that's why I call it more than yeah, just a comic yeah, yeah. girl, you know. And all these books are on Amazon? Yeah, they're all on Amazon, yeah. So going forward for the future? They're all available on download. And yeah. But the books, most of them are available. On, but yeah, with anywhere. Lockdown, everything. Yeah. So going Pretty forward for the future, Richie, you've got your past. What's the plans for the future for you? Well, Hopefully win the lottery and then uh, <laughs> go on a world cruise. Mm-hmm. That'd be lovely, <laughs> wouldn't it? And, uh, well, obviously I, I work for. I'm on the ca- a cable fair. I work mm-hmm. for the cable fair. Mm-hmm. I'll see me last few years out with him before I retire, and then get more into my spiritual work. And maybe he's, if people want books, right, and I'll do that. And mm-hmm. you know, just take each day to it, yeah. but enjoy it. You know what I mean? Cause yeah, enjoy the process. Enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. I think enjoy the process. Ever have your life story turned into a documentary film? There was a, there was a there was another fight I forgot to tell you about when I I fought twenty five lads. Mm-hmm. I ended up in hospital, but I put nine of them away <laughs> before I before I succumbed <laughs> because I was getting hit over the back of the head with bottles and yeah. sticks and that. But that's another mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. Would you ever get into a film? That would have been a good. Story. Yeah. What? Would you ever turn your life into a film if it came across? <sighs> don't know would anyone want to I think so think what so. about does it bring back a lot of emotions speaking about all this stuff no because uh, it just seems that long ago now because mm-hmm. I've distanced myself that far from, yeah. it was, just seems that long ago and like I'm 56 in August mm-hmm. I'm an old man now compared, ah shit man you've got your that, whole life you know ahead I mean? of you man but probably I think my best years are ahead of me you million know what percent I mean? yeah I met my wife Wendy, ten years yeah. ago. Who's an amazing and, woman, by the way. Oh, Wendy, yeah. thanks for having me in your home. She's like <clears throat> opened my eyes to different world. A different world, and we've just we're just going on foreign holidays all, and yeah. we're seeing different places, and we're experiencing all different things together. You know. Yeah. And I've never been as happy and as content as what I am now. And that's what life's with all the right about. Person, yeah, you yeah, know? and that's what life's all about. Oh, but believe. it took me a long time to fight and find the right yeah. person. Of course, but you had to go through your transition. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Can you imagine everyone you met when you were going through that? They would have had to have been crazy. Yeah. To have accepted that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Coming home every night with blood in your shirt and your hands, but. Yeah. For letting me come into your house today, brother, and tell your story, because I know this is the first interview in 15 years. Um, I know, but um, just tell the last thing. Of course. That very last unlicensed fight I had yeah. in, in uh, London. Mm-hmm. I, right, you, you see it on video, Liam Galvin done a video of it, and, and, and I look grotesque. Mm-hmm. A big fat look like I had a foot pump <laughs> in my ass. I was, I was massive. Is that Marcelo or Marcella? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Well, that's how people... Uh, judge me on that mm-hmm. and that wasn't me I was like just hitting 40 I'd never been in a gym for God knows how long but because I had a big punch I thought yeah I'll take the fight mm-hmm. I didn't train I wasn't a big trainer anyway I didn't train so I thought I'll just go down and, and I'll put the big shot on him put him to sleep and then get paid and we'll all go home whatever mm-hmm. and, but this Thursday the fight was on the third. I came down on with flu on the Monday. It turned right in my body, and it was right through my body on the Thursday. I shouldn't have been fighting, right? I was ill. I was weak, shivering, horrible. I still got in that ring and fought, and I should have been in bed. Mm-hmm. I watched the fight, and from that first bell, and I threw that first jab. There was nothing in my body at all. No strength. No power. 
nothing. So I just took a hammer in for them, right? And people judged me because they said, oh, is that, you can't no, they fod, shit. The, but well, they fodged not They fodged around. wasn't me. back strong, but... I didn't. There was nothing in my punches. I thought so. I thought it so. might have looked like it. Yeah. I just... But I was just giving it that. There was nothing in my punches. Mm-hmm. Because it, if I'd have been strong there... I would have took them out because bang, 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 I'd have been putting everything in them. There was just nothing in them. And do you still think about that? I do, yeah, because I think, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and they're judging me on the thing and a, th- a fight that yeah. wasn't me. they never seen the other 150 no, fights when you're other, spanking well, everybody yeah, else. I've never seen that. So. But for letting us come in your house, Richie, and meeting your amazing wife, it's been an absolute pleasure. All the best for the future, well, man, and yeah. I'm always here, mate. If you need a, a chat or whatever, brother, okay, or I can mate. phone you, mate. If I need backup, whatever. Right. <laughs> Cheers, brother.